Jody Shelton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know what, I forget, you come from the sort of, um, I wouldn't say straight comedy, but, you know, the improv musical world, which can be quite comedic. And so, yes, yeah, so you come from that world as well. And so, yeah, so you do kind of like break into character sometimes. Well, that's how we met. We met uh, when I was uh, your improv, your musical improv teacher. Absolutely. It was Baby Wants Candy. Um, yeah. And it was actually um, uh, some of my fellow improv students at, I forget which level, maybe it was like four or five or I don't know, it was one of those levels. Um, maybe it was three. Anyway, so we first went to see uh, a Baby Wants Candy show. And um, so that must have been at Soho Playhouse or Barrow Street. That was probably, probably. where was it? It was like 2010, maybe. That was probably Soho Playhouse, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, and uh, you were there, I think. Um, uh, Ashley, I forget her last name. Ashley Ash Ward. Ashley Ward was in it. Um, and I'm sure uh, Peter Gwynn was there and Winston Knoll and maybe- Peter Gwynn was there, yes. Yeah. yeah, he was always funny. Yeah. Well, he's my 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 writing partner, you know. So we we we've known each other since nineteen, I believe, ninety eight. I believe early nineteen ninety eight, and then we've been writing musicals together for the past 12, 13 years. So yeah, we we've, we've written a few now. So he's, yeah, he's um, real, he's real talented. I like talented people. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. He. So those of uh, people who don't know Peter Gwynn, he used to be one of the writers at um, uh, Colbert Report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah. Um, I, I almost said The Daily Show, but I, I don't think he was. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, he so won awards and did all kinds. Of, he, he got to write lyrics for Stephen Sondheim to listen to. He like rewrote um, the lyrics to Send in the Clowns, I believe for a bit for Steven to sing to Steven Sondheim. And we were just like, nah! like freaking. It was like the most exciting thing. Even though I wasn't working on it, uh, Steven Sondheim is my, you know, uh, musical theater idol. I mean, he's such a God in the field. So the fact that Peter got to do that while Steven Sondheim was there on set, it was just completely crazy. So. That must have been mind blowing. So did you just hear about it or were you there when he sang it to Steven? Sondheim? I wasn't there. He, he was texting. I mean, he was texting me the whole time, like when it aired. I mean, it was, it was, I think he was just really excited and really excited to share what was going. It was really, you know, like yeah. I got to, I got to, I got to write a, um, this is not the same league, but um, I got to write a song for, for BB Newirth to sing on the president's show a few years ago. Um, oh, on wow. Central. And I grew up, with Frazier, like, and and B.B. Newirth um, being that sort of dark, uh, hilarious um, character, the wife of, you know, um, yeah. Frazier. Yeah. Um, and then she went on to be on Frazier too sometimes, but but I just adored her. And then to find out, found out later, she was um, so involved with Bob Fosse and his musicals and and, yes. and, and in Chicago and everything. And so when they, when they said, you know, you're going to be writing a song for for, it's just it's just amazing when you get to do something for one of your idols, you know, yeah. and someone that inspired you when you were a kid, and then you get to create something for them. And she got to she emailed me uh, through the you know it's through the through the production it's all you know, and she she gave me her range, which is kind of a small range, and and I wrote back I was like oh I know Miss North I know your range very well you know like, <laughs> <laughs> like I I know where I know what's I know G's are comfortable you know um, and so I, so I wrote this thing. For her to, to to do on television, it was really exciting. That's, um, that's amazing. Yeah. I, I think uh, BB Newirth. I think uh, she comes from the theater world. I think, yeah. Right. It was just that I mean, um, Fraser there was, when I, and Fraser and, came. I mean, she was still really young, but she yeah. was doing musical theater in college and all through you know and all throughout her career. Yeah. Uh, but she's a dancer, I think, first. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's also a dancer. I mean, she has a dancer's body. If you if you oh yeah. Kind of, yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I, but I didn't know that as well until after Frasier and then, um, 
there were billboards all over Manhattan that BB Newworth were was coming back doing Chicago. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Um, I can't remember if I went to see, I did see Chicago on Broadway. I don't remember if she was in it or maybe that night she wasn't on it. She was supposed to, and it was under understudy or something. I don't know. I can't remember, but um, yeah, but I did want to go see Chicago just because of her. Oh um, yeah. yeah. I mean, she's, she's just one of those magnetic people. Yeah. And then they, they, uh, for the little number I made for them, I, I had not seen the choreography before they, before we taped it. And I was in the audience, you know, a few feet away, and and she, uh, it ended up with them dancing on the table, like on the on the oh. president's <laughs> desk, the, like the Oval Office of, on the set. It was her and with with the, the guy who plays Trump, and it was really, I was just like when, when they got up on the table, like, ah, you know, it was just really exciting. Um, and then they, uh, the, the you know, the part where my little the, the little uh, you know theater kid, my my head exploded when they introduced me to the studio audience. And she she blew me little kisses and jumped up and down. And I was just oh, like, wow. oh. it was just, it, you know, it was just very, very sweet. Wow, that's amazing. So this was, oh, how long ago? That was right, that was in the first year of Trump's presidency. So that was, I guess, four, oh. four years ago. Yeah. Oh, that was really recent. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Well, the show only lasted one season. I, I don't know mm -hmm. why, because I thought it was a really, really funny show. And we, you know, I got to do a few bits musical bits for them yeah. uh and then and then because i think by the time that one aired we knew that that was it so right no 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 we did not know no no there was there was one more thing i did after that and we and by then we kind of knew it was mm. the last one you know so yeah well that's amazing um and you're also um the co-writer for what is that something gray Oh, Fifty Shades. The oh, Fifty Shades, yeah. right. <laughs> yes. Something gray. Something, of, something gray. Like my home, Fifty Shades of Gray. <laughs> uh, you do have some yellow. Well, the floor is wood color, so it's nice and beige. <laughs> wood color. What is, what is that, J.D.? Wood color. Yeah, I'd like it, some like, wood color, please. Hard, hardwood flooring is wood color, no? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I, yes, yes, I, I co-wrote a thing called Fifty Shades of Grey with, with, with four of my closest friends. <laughs> that was very fun. Ashley Ward is that was actually one of the writers on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I actually was... found recently, I was uh -huh. going through, I was going on one of my walks, you know, do you go on COVID walks, JJ? Like where you just like, all you can do is walk around in your neighborhood because we can't go anywhere. Well, I, I walk sometimes. I don't I don't call it a COVID walk, but I just walk. <laughs> it's just a walk. I call it a COVID walk because I'm a morbid, you know. Uh, but I was listening to, I was kind of like shuffling my whole iTunes. Do you ever do that? Like where you just put it on shuffle and random yeah. stuff comes yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just love it because you never know which of my artists like early versions are going to come up or like, you know, some artists I love. Oh, right. Because you have like the early mixes and stuff like that. Oh, gotcha. right. I never I never take anything out. So it's got all that you know, <laughs> crap. But there's a song that we wrote that Ashley and I wrote for Fifty Shades that I'm sure never made it past version one. Like we and you can hear us in the recording. It's just like an iPhone recording laughing just we are so entertained by ourselves and it did not even make the show. Um, <laughs> but it was like another, a, a better, a much better song when in that, in that spot. But the fact that I found it, I didn't even rem remember it at all, was one of those cool things about being, I don't know if you go through this too, as a, as a writer, you find little bits and pieces and you know, yeah, um, it was really fun. Yeah, th that that's always a lot of fun. It's it's kind of like finding money in your coat pocket that you forgot about, <laughs> like you know. But 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 it's like even better than that. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. Uh, like so, like gum, like a, like like a like a stick of gum from last Christmas. Like oh wow, this I haven't worn this coat in nine months. <laughs> and there's still flavor. <laughs> um, actually, that happened to me recently. So as I was preparing material for our upcoming live stream. Uh, on the 21st, plug, plug. Um, uh, I was going through some stuff and, and looking for things, you know, maybe notes that I had made. Uh, yeah, and I found like 
little pieces of stuff that I had written for this album. And I'm like, and I had completely forgotten about it. And I'm like, oh, I should work on these. <laughs> I mean, do you have that thing too of like, like I, I had zero memory of writing it. I mean, it was probably, this was, must've been 2000, I don't know, 12 or 13. So we're talking about like almost a decade ago when we started mm -hmm. writing the show. So I had like, I, I, I was like, oh, like halfway through, I was like, oh yeah. But you write it for an hour or whatever, two hours, on, yeah. you know, on an afternoon with your friend and yeah. then it gets cut and you never think about it again. And so yeah. I find that really cool to like rediscover things. Yeah. Like well, you know, I mean, I mean that kind of also makes sense too because your, your mind is so occupied with a bunch of things that's happening. You know at the time so you you know you really do need to focus on what you need to do and so things that sort of like are taken off the table you're probably not mindful of it at all and then eventually you forget um the other day uh, maybe it was a few weeks ago um you know how like facebook sends you reminders of stuff that you posted years ago and mm -hmm. so like a few years ago i posted on facebook that i had just woken up from a dream that I had where I actually wrote a song. No, I think I think the story goes like I saw myself on stage performing a song and and I but I was still in the audience watching it. So there was like two of me and the audience me noticed that this is not a song I had written. I had not written this. So this must be a new song and somehow in that awareness, I was also aware that I was sleeping, I was dreaming. And so the one, the me that was in the audience kept like singing the song over and over again in my head so that maybe some of that will survive, you know, as I awake. And it did, some of it did. So I made a note of it. And so I actually wrote that down on Facebook and I'm like, and I'm like, okay, where's that note? And I can't find it. It could be, on my old phone that died. <laughs> oh no. That's why you gotta put everything in the cloud, JJ. Everything's gotta go in the cloud. I know, I thought I had backed it up. I don't know, but um, yeah, so. Well, I'll tell you, I didn't, I didn't send this in the list of songs potentially to, to play today, or it would be a great segue. I guess you could find it. But yeah. there's, a, there's a song that I wrote for Daughter and Son mm -hmm. um, when my friend Garrett uh, one of my good friends, actually, he was the stage manager for Baby Wants Candy, the musical improv group. And we would travel the country together and tour with these, you know, these dummies and have the best time. And then he was going to move to L.A. And he's, you know, one of my best friends. He's just a really, really sweet guy, really funny. And we spent our sort of last dinner together, you know, drinking and eating and stuff. And then we said goodnight. And I, and I had, I've like felt this feeling, this sort of like sadness and, you know, oh. this, but, but this sort of like, I'll see you again kind of thing. And it was too late for me to record anything. It was too late for me to put down the, you know, but I just knew that it was such a strong feeling that I was going to wake up in the morning and have the song mm. and that it was not going to leave me. I just, I just knew it to be true. And I woke up first thing, grabbed my guitar, grabbed my phone and just sent, and it was a song called Down the Road. And not only did I write it really quickly and it was just like still in me from the night before, um, I, it's the only song I've ever done in completely in one take. Mm. Um, because it just, I don't, I can't sing it differently. I just sing it kind of like, um, almost like a folk song, like, a like yeah. just like around the, around the campfire. I can't make it better or make yeah, it yeah. prettier. I just can't sing it one way. And it sort of feels, you know, that's one of those experiences that I loved, um, yeah. as a singer songwriter, um, yeah. to sort of like, just trust that the feeling and the song, it's all going to be there in the morning, you know? Yeah. So now that you bring it up, so you're you're no longer a singer songwriter. You've retired. So I have speak. retired. I mean, I I don't know what the future holds. You never know. So but I spent so many years doing it, and it, you know, I was really really active, and and both as a solo artist, and then with with daughter and son, this um, uh, project I did with uh, with Katie Fawful and this guy Oscar Alvis Rodriguez, and. You know, we, we worked really hard and we did lots of stuff that I'm proud of. And, you know, it, at a certain point, it just became, you know, I have so many artists that I love to work with, like UJJ and other people. Um, and I spent my sort of singer songwriter years, you know, developing these skills to produce other people. Yeah. Um, and I loved my like 20 years of being a singer songwriter. It was 
fabulous and phenomenal and I could do it again, but I've, I've lost that sort of like hunger mm. that it takes to, to do a residency at Rockwood or go on tour, or, you know, put together a band and do an album. I'm, I have so many things going on with other people and with my musicals and with, you know, um, other projects. I just, you know, it, it, it's something that I consider to be the past and I'm, I'm mm. so glad I did it. And it's, it's always going to be part of me. And I love those songs, especially the daughter and son material that I developed with Kate, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm retired for now. Since 2015, I'm retired. Um, oh, as of 2015, you've retired. Um, that was my last, yeah, my last show was that year, yeah. Okay. Did you know that it was going to be your last show? I mean, so you kind of knew you were going to hang up that coat? Yeah, I think I think I, pro I, I thought there was a slight possibility maybe we could come back or something, but I did one last solo show with Kate there as well, but it was just me singing with Ashley Ward and Roman Peters, my two friends from the comedy world and some musicians that I love. Actually, Al Materi on drums from Baby Wants Candy. It was like a big sort of confluence of a lot of my, you know, uh -huh. lives. And we sang a bunch of my songs and a bunch of bluegrass songs and just like whatever, you know, I wanted to do. Nice. And it was it was such a fun way to sort of go out. Um, Where was I? I don't remember. Was I there? I don't. I don't know if I would. No, I think the last show I saw was with you and Kate. It okay. was a daughter and son's show. Um, I think okay. maybe it was like maybe your. I think you did you put out two albums or three albums with her? Two, two albums. Two. Mm -hmm. I it might have been your second album release. Okay, um, so in, in Rockwood yeah. two, the bigger sort of stage. Yeah, the bigger stage where you had the balcony. Yeah. 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 I saw, Did I you sit I, in the balcony or where, where, where were you sitting? I was in the balcony. Uh, so almost like behind the stage. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like like over to the side. Over to the side, but it felt like we were behind the stage because like, we, we, yeah, it was sort of weird angle. Yeah. Cool. I love that. I miss Rockwood. I want to go back. I want to see people and musicians and be in a place that's not, I love my home, but <laughs> be in a different place. You know, last Sunday was the first first time I actually left Flushing since the lockdown. Oh my God, really? Yeah. Well, yeah, I had uh, I got my second shot uh, last Monday. Um, so I was actually going to record with Sebastian last Monday, uh, but I was going to get my shot and I had a feeling like, oh, what if I get sick, you know? Uh, so I had to reschedule him and that's why I did it with him yesterday. Uh, but sure enough, I did get sick. It was like for 48 hours, I was like dead. And then the rest of the that week- That second shot is brutal. It's yeah. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and it did take about a week to kind of recover. I, I'm still feeling a little fatigued, um, but I'm not, I don't feel sick sick, you know? Right, right. Yeah. But it does feel amazing to be able to have yeah. people over and like like I've had you know fully vaccinated people like artists of mine come to record and I had a cellist here a couple weeks ago for Sherelle Bryant's record and just like it's you know it was just such a surreal feeling to be like you know like conducting a like a real life cellist and you know it just uh, it, it's been over a year it's crazy yeah 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 uh so hopefully things will sort of get back you know into full swing of things soon I think um yeah I mean you know at least in New York I don't know about the other states you know anyone who's 16 or over can get shots now whether or not you could get an appointment or you know like how long you have to wait for that appointment that's a different story but uh I got mine uh you know I got my appointment pretty quickly so I mean by the time I got my second shot it was like I was, it was in and out. I didn't have to even wait. I went right to get my shot and then I had to wait 15 mm -hmm. minutes at the end. I think the whole thing was like 18 minutes. Yeah, the second so. shot. Yeah, yeah, it was like that. Actually also by the second shot, like I, cause you know, you go back to the same place. It feels like they they had their act together a little more. Uh, yeah. So, you know, things were more streamlined. Um, totally. But anyway, after my first shot, I was like, woohoo, I got myself an ice cream, took pictures, posted on Facebook. So after the second shot, I don't know, I felt like, oh, whatever, I, I've done that already. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah, 
But um, but anyway, I mean, I, I did have an incentive. I was kind of like, um, I was really not in a hurry to get my shots for some reason. I felt like, oh, you know, because I haven't gone anywhere. And I had I didn't really have any plan plans to go anywhere, you know. Um, I did everything out of my home. So, uh, but it wasn't until we were, we started talking about the live stream, and uh, and then you and I was thinking I was sort of like I don't know thinking weird about it that we were all going to do this remotely, and you were like, how are we going to do that remotely? <laughs> it's not going to work. No, the, I mean, people don't think about that lag. It's really, I remember the first musical improv rehearsal we attempted to have, this is yeah. last March or maybe early April of 2020. And we have developed a way, I'll, I can tell you about it if you, you're curious, but yeah. um, but we just, we said, well, let's, let's just try it. Let me just try to play. I think I played the warm up, you know? And I think I just started to play, you know, my normal zoo warm up or whatever. And everyone started singing. But everyone's on a one second delay, a two second delay, a half second delay. And it just sounds like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> like it just sounded like. And you it's really impossible. It's it's not something that they've been able to, you know, you can record yourself individually and then someone can edit it together later, but it's impossible to play live. It's just too much of a yeah. We don't have that, we're not technologically there yet, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it is mainly with the connection. I think if if the the Wi-Fi or the future of Wi-Fi, whatever that's going to be, you know, becomes a little more instantaneous than, you know, maybe. Because the present of Wi-Fi is not my favorite, JJ. Let me just no. tell you, I do not like it. It's always a problem. You know, you'll be like in the middle of a sentence and then it... <laughs> <laughs> and, and people are laughing at you. You're like, why, why is everyone laughing? It's like, oh, because you're Wi-Fi. Oh, okay, I see. You know, everyone's laughing. Great. You know, um, yeah. I, I don't know if that's happened to me uh, since I got Fios, but you know what what hap what was funny is um, my building did not have Fios, so I originally got uh, cable. Cable sucked; it was like so bad. So then I got DSL. DSL was actually better than cable in my house in my apartment. And uh, but you could imagine like DSL is like so old technology. Um, but uh, January of 2020, um, we got a notice from Verizon saying like, hey, uh, Fios is available in your building now. I'm like, so I called them up, got it installed, end of January, you know, about a month before the lockdown started. <laughs> Otherwise, I mean, yeah. <laughs> the one thing that's, that's really been eye-opening to me is how, I mean, we've, what we've been able to do mm -hmm. during the lockdown uh, the fact that I've been able to record with people and record remotely and help them have a setup in their own home and then figure out, you know, how to send those tracks to me and I mix them and produce them here. You know, that, that's that been an amazing thing that we've been able to do. But there are so many technological issues. If, if we're so reliant upon these machines to, to, to do our jobs, then they better work. And yeah. when they don't, it's just so frustrating to me because I need it to work. People are paying me money to make their dreams come true. And if the, if the machine isn't working, what can I do? Nothing I can do, <laughs> you know? So speaking of dreams. So when you were, when you were uh, little, you know, and as you were growing up, did you know that you were gonna be working in music? Was this? I mean, a hundred percent. There's okay. there's nothing else I've ever had even a little bit of interest in. <laughs> <laughs> or nor have I been good at. I don't know how to do anything else. I'm completely. If if I can't do music, I would just be a hobo on the street. <laughs> and that's probably the, the truth. I mean, I've done things. You know, back in the past, I you know I was a restaurant manager. I did. You know, I worked in retail when in my twenties. You know. Uh, I, I, when I was 19, I had a job at, at uh, uh, European Tan and Day Spa in Chicago. I got paid, I think, five fifty dollars an hour. Um, but, it, you know, when I was like 12 or 13, I always said I wanted to be, you know, either uh, Carol King, uh, who is in the 70s, or uh, Stephen Sondheim, who was a, you know, uh, 
the most famous musical theater composer, or Mark Shaman, who went on to become a musical theater composer, is the for a while the the developer of special musical material on SNL. So I would see him, you know, up, accompanying the Sweeney sisters on that. Like I had this one medley of theirs, a uh, Christmas medley. Do you remember the Sweeney sisters from SNL? They were a, a a duo, a, a duo, I think of of sisters, and they just did. It was Jan Hooks and oh god, what's her name? Oh, I can't remember her name. But they they did this ding dong ding dong ding dong ding dong ding ling 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 ling. Just hear the sleigh bells ring. It was like this amazing oh, yeah, that Christmas medley. Yes. And Mark Shannon was on piano. And I didn't know. I was like, I'm gonna be him. And then a few months later, I saw uh, Bette Midler on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Remember, he like it was like his last. Yes. show and, yes. and she was his last guest and she sang yeah. one for my baby and one one more for the road with special material and there on the piano was the same guy so i had and she was like ladies and gentlemen mark shane and i was like that's who i want to be i want to be that guy i want to develop comedic musical it seems like such a niche specific job yeah. but that's what i wanted to do when i was like however old that was and so well, i wanted to be one of those three jobs and so i've gotten to in my life you know be a singer songwriter and be a, a musical theater composer and be a producer and and a, a writer of special comedic material so in a way i mean that's in a small way my dreams have come true jj yeah no i that <laughs> i i would say that's no small way i would say that's huge for you to be able to actually do uh what you dreamt of doing when you were you know a boy and and actually and and actually making a real go of it, you know. I mean, you're making a living doing that. Um, so that I that's huge. Um, well, thank you, JJ. That's very sweet of you. I'm very grateful to get to do what I do, and it's it's because of y'all that I get to do it. So I mean, honestly, yes, uh, my, my, my artists like, are like my yeah, my my babies. Is that yeah? Is that why um, uh, uh, you like working with artists? So in a way, you're sort of nurturing their dreams. Yeah, I mean, that's, I've got this sort of like, um, I guess like a mentor's heart, you know, I've got like, a, I, I, I like to help people do stuff better, like do music stuff better. <laughs> and so, and I like, I like a puzzle, you know? So like, mm. if someone comes to me with the, like Jen Kwok came to me with this song, a couple years ago, just on a ukulele. And she's like, I want to blow this out and make it big, but I have no idea. And I just had this vision in my mind. It was a song called um, uh, Desert to the Sea, which we turned into this big sort of like synth, you know, uh, in vocal, there's like 25 gens, you know, singing. Uh, <laughs> and, one, and one of me going, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> that's, the, that's the secret. If you hear like the, something, all you're like, what's that weird keyboard? That's my, my low voice. Um, <laughs> But I just, that's the stuff I love to do. I love that kind of problem solving and mm -hmm. figuring out, you know, this, this isn't working. How can I make it work? And that's just what I like to do. It's, that, it's that's fun. Inter yeah, that's interesting. So one of my earlier guests is a singer songwriter, St. Lennox. And um, um, he basically described uh, songwriting that way, exactly that way. That was basically problem solving. Um, so you have like a line here or melody here or whatever like okay how do I put this together or like what does this need or you know I'm sure I'm butchering his description of it <laughs> <laughs> I mean I, I always think of myself as two different people I don't know if you do too when you're writing a song but it's like uh, there's the writer so like the creator and he's the one with the sparks you know like he, you know um and then there's the editor, the sort of like yes. producer, the one who comes in and, and takes the parts and makes them work. And that's, yeah. um, that's he, he's the grown up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I actually, I did not think of it in those terms until recently when um, I recently, I joined a bunch of uh, singer songwriter Facebook groups. I, I figured like, I need, maybe I should connect with other singer songwriters, I don't know. Uh, so I joined a bunch of Facebook groups and, um, and I've been sort of kind of looking at some of the posts and, um, and one of the posts actually described it that way, that, um, uh, that there's actually two sides, you know, there's the writer and then there's the editor. 
And, um, you know, and sometimes, sometimes we get stuck. Well, what he was describing was like writer's block, like why sometimes we get writer's block is you get stuck in editing mode. So it's very, you know, you're looking at things through a very critical eye, as opposed to like sort of letting the ideas and, and energy flow. Uh, so that can sometimes block you from creating new, new things. Actually, this leads us to a track that I sent you, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. So let, so, so let me explain. Yeah. So Rebecca Vigil is, is an artist that I work with and she uh, she played Princess Leia in a, uh, oh, May the Fourth Be With You, by the way. Today is oh, May the thank fourth. you, it's, yes. Uh, it's, May the yeah. Fourth Be With You. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote a, uh, a Star Wars uh, parody musical a few years ago that did not get picked up, but we did a workshop and it was really fun. And uh, Rebecca played uh, General Leia, Princess Leia. And, uh, and it was really great. And we've done lots of stuff together. And I've, you know, we, we're really good friends. And so uh, she's been doing in, in 2021, a, a new song every month. Mm. Um, but what's great about, and then she puts it on Instagram. So go to uh, who is Rebecca Vigil, I think. Instagram. I'm sorry if I messed that up. Um, but, but Rebecca Vigil on Instagram. And she oh, does these little like, like one minute, uh, one minute songs. And uh, she brought this song to me that was like a partial song. And she, and this is what's great about collaboration. We started working on it and it was about one thing. It was about how long we've been in COVID. We can't believe it's been a year, you know, in lockdown. And then we started working on it and working on it and remotely because she's in Denver now. And we were on on uh, Zoom and just sort of like going, you know, back and forth on ideas. And I would send her new drums and scents and stuff. And we spent two hours on it. And then by the time I saw her next, the following week, it had changed completely. <laughs> and it was about how, because it, it has this like driving sort of like like workout beat to it. And it, and she uh, hosts and and runs uh, workout classes, like these hit classes as well. She's really popular. People love those classes. And by the it was the the new uh, version of the song that she came up with was I can't believe I have to exercise every day for the rest of my life to stay in shape. <laughs> I can't believe this. And so she wrote this really fun song. It's pretty quick. Um, uh, called I can't believe. So if you have that, it's number one. Yeah. It's um. I'll uh, open it up. I love this song. This one, uh, hold on, let me bring this down here. This is it. Oh, you're kidding me. Let's download it. Okay, now it's trying to open it up in iTunes, hold on. Okay. okay, so now I have to I guess share. we should have had a tech rehearsal, JJ. Okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, for, uh, hold on. Stop it. You can edit this part out. You can edit this part out. It's fine. We just like, just snip it. Just give a little snip. Nobody will ever know. <laughs> it's It's playing and I can't seem to... What the fuck? Where's my... I, why won't my iTunes open? I oh, it is know, open. JJ. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, share screen. Sound. iTunes. Oh, yeah.
Isn't that hilarious? Oh, that's great. I love that song. I think it's it, it like goes through my head all the time. I'm like, ah. and she does these really funny, cute videos. Like that video of, is her just working out like like a mad woman. Um, yeah, it's uh, a little different than what you and I do, JJ. <laughs> yeah, what you and I do. What what do you and I do? <laughs> I don't. It's it's folk music. It's pretty folk uh, folk singer songwriter music. Um, oh, you mean you mean in terms of music style? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess it's 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 sort of folky. It's not real folk though, right? It's folky, but it's not like straight folk. I feel well, like. singer songwriter is its own genre. That's a pretty you know yeah. broad. You know, you can do anything within that genre. And I mean, technically, Rebecca Vigil is a singer songwriter. She's just a doing working in a very different yeah. sort of yeah. Um, musical i mean and that's the thing about comedy people that's a little bit different you know everything is about hitting the sort of game of the song sort of like you know so that was all about working out so it's got a workout vibe mm. so um uh you know so every, every song is not about her you know it's about her personal style but it's about sort of what's going to be the funniest mm -hmm. musical choice to go with that lyric and with that kind of song does that make sense yeah, oh no, it absolutely does. Um, and I I realized long ago that I'm not really a comedian, although I would love to be one. Um, and um, I think- Well, it's uh, good you took improv. I mean, improv is great for everyone to, to take, you know? Yeah. No, absolutely. And that, that certainly taught me a lot of lessons and stretched me in a lot of ways. Uh, but in, in, the, in the midst of taking like two years of improv classes, I did take one stand-up comedy writing class and and it was it was after that class it was definitely you know hit the nail or nailed me into the coffin or whatever the expression is that um that i knew for certain i'm not a comedian <laughs> i mean Improviser there's nothing maybe. <laughs> there's nothing that would make me more anxious in the world than having to get up in front of people and tell jokes. I just don't, I mean, I'm, I, I think I'm a funny person. I work yeah. in comedy, I'm a, you know, I'm a comedy person. Being a stand-up is my personal health. Yeah. It would be, it's just, I've seen so many people bomb and and each audience is different. You know, I mean, like you never know what you, what your setup is gonna be. Like I've done so many corporate gigs. Like there was one baby once, Andy goes, JJ, this was so awful. Cause we do all this, we did tons of corporate stuff you know and so you're you're you know teaching improv to to corporate people or uh -huh. you know and they're doing it with each other and it's it's great it's a great team building exercise for for corporations yeah. and i've done tons of it um and you write special material for you know and you do a show so it's like it's like um helen down in hr she's so crazy you know that kind of thing <laughs> and it's really i mean and it's really crazy it's really you know i've written probably 60 or 70 of those kinds of songs in my career um but we did this one it was we, we were getting ready for our, our set like the baby wants candy set which you you're, you need the audience to be ready for you improv and stand up you, you need them to be hot right yeah yeah and they and right before we go on the lights go down and they say at this time we would like to play a video in memoriam of all we have lost this year from the company from the company and they played a video me? of everyone who had died you're kidding me. With sad music and the lights down. They brought the lights up and they go, who's ready for some comedy? <laughs> and we were like, oh my gosh, it was, Wh who's I mean, bright to idea? have to go on and do, I don't know. It was the worst. We, I was in panic mode. Like my first song was like, doo -doo -doo -doo, like the fastest <laughs> song you ever heard. I've got to get some, we got to get wake these people up. Oh, it was a nightmare, nightmare. It, you know, whoever was the event manager for that event, is it the, that was the most incompetent way to put together an event. No, no, you don't do that. <laughs> I mean, it, I don't know. People maybe thought like, oh, we'll do something sad and then we'll do something funny to keep, you know, I, I don't know what they're thinking, but for comedy people, that's just yeah, uh, a nightmare. But, but yeah. you, that's why I just don't, like being, a, being alone on stage with the mic is probably the worst time I can think of. Bless that's, them, that's bless them. That's how I feel about me performing on stage. I know, I mean, there there have been times when you very strongly encouraged me to do my you know own solo shows and stuff, and I'm like, no, I don't want to. <laughs>
It's hard. I need, it's really I need hard. my voice. I need my voice <laughs> on stage with me. You need a sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> and and just, you know, just, to be just, just pull out the clown. You know, whenever you whenever there's a lull, just look over at Jody and like, you know. <laughs> oh Lord. Lord help no, me. no, I don't need a focus pull. I need support. <laughs> And that I am for you. <laughs> oh no, you absolutely are. And 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 you know, and I said this to to you before. It wasn't until I actually started watching my own show videos that I realized like how much you guys did support me on stage. Yeah. And, um, and <laughs> ever since then, I, I just like I should have I should have watched them before. <laughs> I mean, I'm a firm but, believer in you know. Back when I was performing, uh, yeah. I would have every every show filmed and then I would usually before I could go to bed that night I would watch it and then like a student like a good student just take notes um on everything that was good and everything that was bad and I just it, it helped me to grow so much as a, yeah. as a performer and, and now it helps me to help other people and that's the thing really for me is that I had to be an actor for a while to figure out how to deal with actors and I had to be a singer-songwriter for a while to figure out how to deal with singer-songwriters you know it helps to, to have done a bunch of jobs in show business. Like I built a set, I built, built a set, you know? So it, it helps to kind of like have done a little bit of everything so you can be involved, you know? And yeah. kind of understand what everyone's job is, you know, exactly. So it really yeah. was a progression for you. Um, so unlike um, like Sebastian, uh, where he, he started out as a guitarist, he's still a guitarist. Um, I mean, he does have his own band that he leads and, and he does do, he does some, you know, producing work and he also has students that he teach, but primarily he's a guitarist. Uh, but you, you really, you know, through your career, you went through some major sort of blocks of e evolution, I think, right? You were pianist, singer, songwriter, uh, musical director, Improv director, coach. Op opera singer. I was an opera singer. Oh, I forgot uh, about that. Yeah, that was I. Um, yeah, I was I was in the opera program at DePaul in Chicago, and so they made they you know and and this is actually kind of a, kind of a fun story. Did I ever tell you about my teacher who got frustrated with me because my, my voice wasn't my opera voice wasn't coming along? Have I told I, you the story? I um, think you may have, but tell it again. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell I'll tell our audience here. Hi, how are you? I'll tell you a story. Um, so my teacher, I'm not gonna say her name was. Um, I'm not gonna say her name. Uh, <laughs> she did not. She was a wonderful teacher and very serious about opera. And I was 19 years old. Okay, I was very very young, and I was, I was there on a scholarship. And they they don't want you to sing anything else, which I always did. And they didn't want you to do things like I was smoking cigarettes. They didn't want you to do that. They didn't want you to drink or do it. It was it was very rigid, sort of like uh, conservatory program and my teacher um you know you always go to voice lessons and you stand there and you sing and warm up whatever and um one uh and and she, i was always doing bits and if i'm uncomfortable I, I can't help but joke around and she doesn't like that she doesn't she did not want she wanted serious opera you know and she was like you know jody your your voice isn't developed it's, it's such a great voice it's just not an operatic voice i want you to take this cd home and she gave me one of her personal cds of sam raimi this like big Basso profundo, like, oh, kind of singer. And she said, I want you to come back next week. She thought she was going to get me, right? And come back next week doing an impression of Sam Raimi. And she thought she'd get me through comedy. She'd get me there, you know. But I thought, well, I'm going to get her. You know what? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get her real good. I'm going to do such a, like, like dead on, like, but just a little heightened impression of this guy. And I'm going to just blow it out. I'm going to be like, oh, like so stupid and I'm going to make her laugh so hard and then I get there and I've been working so hard and I was like oh I'm going to goof on this so hard it's going to be so fun and I sing the aria and she sits back in her chair and she goes congratulations Jody you're an opera singer <laughs> and I was like she got me she got me and she got me good and she did she changed my voice forever like I if I had not dropped out of the program because I hate it I, I can't be an opera singer I just I'm not dedicated enough but I became one she turned me into one and so now I can access those notes if I need to and sing big you know big low bass arias and musical theater things you know mm -hmm. yeah if um, I have to. so in in your producing work you do a bunch of things you you 
do your own instrumentation sometimes. Um, if you're not actually playing the keyboard, uh, you're also using samples, music samples. Um, you also play the guitar um, and you also do vocals, uh, backup vocals. Um, and you do so many things and you also do voice coaching and uh, and all of that so oh and also uh mixing engineering <laughs> do you do mastering i don't do mastering i let's okay. always let my uh, another a mastering engineer i need someone else to put their ears on it to give me you know i can't because when you're doing everything yourself which yeah. i'm i'm glad to be a one-stop shop i'm i'm i pride myself on it and it took me a long time to figure out how to do those things. So I feel really proud of the work that I do with people. But at, at a certain point, I need some more ears. I need another set of ears on my on my work. Mm -hmm. So I've got a couple of friends who I trust, who I send stuff to, and they give me notes. And then I uh, have a couple of mastering engineers that I, who I trust. And um, I can't, there's no way I could do the mastering myself. That would just, I don't, and I don't want to learn that. And it's, it's not something I want to do. I don't want to do it. <laughs> what is, is mastering more technical than, than creative? Is that why? What exactly it's a different, is mastering? It, yeah, it's a different set of stuff. So, so you have um, when you go to a mastering suite, it's usually like you know three, you know three or four sets of speakers, so they can hear it like like it's in a car, like it's in a hi-fi, like it's in a hi-fi, like it's the sixties, um, <laughs> like like it's coming through headphones, like it's like and 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 what they're trying to do is equalize the the track, so it's going to sound good everywhere. Um, and so the highs aren't, you know, popping too high. The lows aren't popping too low. Uh, or uh. It, it's just, it's just taking everything and squeezing, you know, squishing it a little bit. Not too much. You don't want to squeeze, you know, squish it too much. Um, but that's a skill set I have. I literally have zero interest in. It just, it, it takes a lot of learning. And I, at this stage, I'm, I'm so focused on my, the stuff that I do with my artists that I don't, I would, I have like a, a mastering stage I use for you guys for your demos and stuff just to make it sound. Yeah fine but i don't yeah. beyond that i'd rather let these other guys do it uh i, I don't I'm, I'm imagining you have to have really fine-tuned ears uh to sort of like i don't think my hearing is all that good in terms i don't think it's that refined because i hear things and i can tell you if i like it or if it's good or you know like good like according to my taste i guess uh but like i couldn't tell you if it's um I don't know any more than that. <laughs> so like uh, case in point. So since I've been doing this podcast, like, you know, sometimes the audio gets messed up. Like there, you know, it, it hits that like upper thing and, and sounds grainy or whatever. And so I, I would try to, um, uh, to uh, edit it. And uh, I have uh, audition, uh, Adobe audition. So I'm doing that and I'm like using the equalizer and this and that. I'm watching a bunch of YouTube videos to see like how to do that and stuff. And I'm like listening for it. I'm like, I can't really tell <laughs> if it's better or not. I mean, it's sometimes it's a very, I mean, like Jen, Jen Kwok and I work together remotely now and she yeah. will, we're doing this thing where she'll, do a live performance that's going to go, you know, uh, be synced to video and, you know, it's just recorded with one mic in her, you know, actually two mics, is that two mics or one mic? I can't remember, but she'll, she'll want me to do like, we call it full face version, which is like lots of stuff, <laughs> lots of compression, lots of EQ, lots of, you know, maybe a little reverb, a lot of, a lot of sweetening. And then we'll do, we have a version called, we call it a little rouge, which is just like a little, you know, and then we have one that's like nude, you know, where it's just like, like, yeah. you know, a clean face. Maybe just a, some little things that are going to help the music, but nothing that the audience will maybe be able to hear or notice. Yeah. Um, and so there are a million different ways, you know, but I think for me, it's just been a matter of not only learning from other people and learning from really good engineers and really good producers over, over time and from stupid YouTube and books and school and Berkeley and stuff, but also just trusting my ears and like playing around yeah. with what EQ does and what, 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 you know, delay does and what, what delay I prefer and what, you know, how to use pitch correction, how to not overuse it. And, you know, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's a lot to learn. Yeah. So it's, I, I, I'm, yeah. I, I guess also it is also putting in the hours too, you know, putting in the time and over time, 
maybe maybe I will be able to make the distinction between this or that, you know. I can't, I, I don't even know the terms really. <laughs> to even, like, well, you've learned a lot though, like in our, in our, in our working together and like yes. about production and about, about your own, you know, you've done, we've done a couple of recordings together and we work yeah. together for over a decade now, right? It's been probably uh, around 10 years. Since 2011, it'll be 10 years, 10 oh. year anniversary. Wow, Yay. congratulations. Oh, so I'm, uh -huh. I'm bringing drinks to our live uh, stream event. So I got, I got these like rice whiskey, like it's, it's like small batch brew, uh, this um, boutique uh, distillery in Brooklyn. Um, that's where I was on Sunday. Um, there was an event, uh, sort of quasi outdoor event there. But anyway, um, yeah, so I got- Well, I'll take a tiny sip while we're working. I don't drink while I work, but I'll, I'll take a tiny sip to taste it. And then afterwards I'll drink it all. No, no, no. The, so <laughs> I got three different kinds, right? So yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you more about it. Like, um, so in the beginning, you know, I'm gonna say a few things and introduce you guys and whatever. So, you know, we'll do that little couple of minute intro, but yeah, we're gonna drink it. <laughs> I don't think when I work, JJ, I can, especially well, not around people. I don't do it around, you know, I'm well, sober as a judge right now. We'll, we'll, we'll take a sip. No, I mean, you know, we don't have to drink the whole bottle. We'll just take a sip. No, no, actually yeah. I'll tell you a story. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't mind telling the story because I, I think it's been enough times gone by. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a baby wants candy show yeah. at Barrow street. This has got to be 13 years ago. Yeah. And it, there was a lot, there were a lot of understudies in the show. And I, so, you know, I didn't even think about it. And my, my family had come in, my, my brother and his wife had come to see the show. They, they'd never seen it before. And Christian was coming, he never comes, my husband. And so like, it was really, I was, but, but we had been out to dinner. I'd had a couple of drinks and the show was the worst show we had ever done. And I blamed myself. I know it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. It was the understudies and just the combination of the bad audience and under rehearsed understudies and maybe my having a couple of drinks, but I, Ever since then, I used to like go on stage with a couple of drinks, you know, but now I, after that experience, I want to be mm. as in control as I possibly can. Um, maybe if I have, you know, if I'm like at a loose cabaret at the duplex or something, I'll, you know, <laughs> have one throughout the show. But I, you know, it's, I, I get really, I want to feel like I'm, you know, All right. there. Then we'll do it after. I mean, I'll have a sip, but no more than a sip. Right, no, but we could, so we'll, yeah, we'll do it. At, so maybe we won't do it at the beginning of the session. When, when we, after we wrap up the session and we say goodbye to the live stream audience, there'll probably be maybe one or two toast. people. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a toast and, and whatever. Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. We'll do it that way. Yeah. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, mess up any uh, flow or whatever. Yeah. I don't want to do that. All right, cool. I mean, okay. I've, I've got videos of me from back in the day when I was just like, come on, <laughs> the music, man, you know, like, um, and it's not fun to watch. It's a mess, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't think we were going to get like that. I, oh, I lost you. Um, yes, I got a, a call from the lobby door and I declined them, so. Oh, do you need to get them? I could pause. Yeah. I'm not okay. worried about that right now. Not worried about okay. That. Um, yeah, I mean, cause like in, in, in other episodes, like we had to take, you know, bathroom breaks or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's never like clean. <laughs> do you, do, do you edit? Do you snip? Do you do a little? Um, only if it's, uh, if it's very disruptive, but if I pause and then I come back on, then, you know, then it's fine. Uh, but like, if there is a, you know, major disruptive stuff, then yeah, I do, I do snip it. Yeah. But like okay. us talking about this, like, I'm not going to edit that. Yeah. It's, it's all part of the reality or whatever. Okay. Yeah. It's Here fine. we are. Yeah. Here we are doing our thing. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah. So I have a question. So like you work with different kinds of artists. Um, uh, does it like cross over to different genres too? in terms of music style? Oh yeah, I mean like right now I've got, I'm just looking at my list of artists here. Rebecca, you heard is kind of, I mean, she does like a lot of R&B sort of like, you know, that sort of clubby thing. Um, Jay Mowski does kind of, you know, all kinds of from country songs to, 
to sort of like gay club anthems, you know, it's, it's really, there's a new one of, of theirs called Eat the Rich that, I, that just came out like two days ago. So I, I can play that if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, Jen Kwok, as you know, play, I mean, does everything from sort of synth pop to just, just, you know, quiet R&B on a piano to uh, her brand new song that just dropped, which we could play anytime. Yeah. Um, called Ooh, I Can't Wait is really funny. And, and usually Jen and I, maybe we, maybe we, we go to Jen now. Uh, Jen okay. has done lots of different styles with me. We started with a song called Shittier, which was about um, how it was right at the beginning of Trump, uh, the Trump era. And she wrote this song about how sometimes things have got to get real shitty before they can get better. And about how her um, parents, parents yeah. had, were, 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 sort of, were sort of forced out of Vietnam and they met in California. And had they not been forced out of Vietnam in this awful conflict and all these terrible people, you know, these people died and, you know, they would not have met each other and they never, never would have had Jen. And so it's this sort of like beautiful, um, you know, metaphor for the mo for, for that moment. And then we did an EP of all, um, well, we did the, the songs for one. Did you ever go up to songs for one, JJ? Yes, her, I did. Her, the, yeah, I did. That where she, she just sang, uh, so we developed that together, which was really, really fun. Uh, and that was just where she would sing a 15 minute set just for one person in a, in a room. And if you experienced it, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, but um, yeah, it was it's, um, yeah, it's, it is, it's very intimate. It's very personal. And in some ways it's intimidating as well. Cause um, you know, uh, but despite the fact that I put myself out there and I perform and I'm doing this podcast and all that, I'm an extremely shy person. <laughs> I don't like being in the spotlight, and um, and I actually, in when you're in when you're in a performance and you're in the audience, the audience portion is dark, right? And um, and it's you know, uh, and the people who are performing can't really see you. I mean, you know, maybe they can hear you, but they can't really see you. But here, the song for one, they can see you. <laughs> they can see you react. <laughs> You're like face I mean, to face, and, and you and you can talk about this on her episode. She's got her own episode, but, but yeah. we, we she had every kind of reaction you could imagine. Yeah, to this show, like people who wanted to just go in the corner and lie down, and people who wanted yeah. to like get in there and cry and be like, oh, oh, oh. oh no, I you know? so, I definitely cried. Yeah. No, well, yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. a very emotional experience. Uh, I mean, I cried multiple times while we were developing it. You know. So Jen, yeah. So songs for one, and then we did this whole sort of like um, um, synth you know, pop record uh, that was based on Songs for One called Songs for One. That was very different than Songs for One itself, but it was the songs from that from that show. And then uh, her most recent thing just came out. So play it, it's called Ooh, I Can't Wait. Um, it right. literally just came out on Instagram a few months ago. And, um, it's, and it's, it's about COVID. So it's a fun little bop about COVID. And, we, and usually we spend weeks and weeks and weeks producing stuff and, and working on stuff and months and years but this one we produced in, I think, a couple hours, <laughs> real fast, remotely, just a few instruments. And uh, I think it's so fun. Ooh, I can't wait to walk down the street and see an old acquaintance. She says, Jen, we should grab a coffee sometime. I say, hell yeah. So she sends an email, I send an email, she sends a text, and I send two texts, and then No one bothers to follow up, I can't wait to go to Cape Town for some doors up, even bop And then we'll get a karaoke room and sing loudly and a lot At the end of the night, we'll say goodbye, I'll be like, oh my god, I love you so much And then we'll hug three times, almost cry two times, and then realize we're on the same train I can't wait to go to a party and meet a bunch of people they forget all the names of 30 seconds later like I'm so sorry your name is Gerbando Sarah right Sarah Bye. I can't wait actually I'm gonna wait for my vaccine I can't wait reentry is hard so please be gentle with yourself I can't wait Isn't that fun? <laughs> yeah, so fun. Is she is she doing a music video for that? 
I don't know. I, it might just be Instagram. I'm not, I'm not sure. I know yeah. it's streaming. It might be streaming right now. I'm not sure when it went live or if it goes live tomorrow or. Yeah. Um. But that's um. We recorded that. I haven't seen her in over a year, so we did that from her place upstate and then from my place uh, here in Queens. Oh, she's upstate now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so I've done tons of styles with her, and and I I I I've got a hip hop artist and sort of a country artist, and I you know. I really love the challenge of flexing tons of different genre muscles, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, that's part of, that's part of the puzzle for me is like figuring out what, um, how to, how to best approach those things. And so like, uh, Sherelle Bryant, this one artist who we're, we're completing her record now. It's so good. Um, the song with the cello on it, I was like, this is the saddest song I've ever heard and I'm going to need to put some cello on it. (laughs) So we, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote this beautiful, I mean, I'll, I'll admit it, it's a really beautiful cello part in three parts. And my friend alone came to, to record it. And I played it for a couple of friends. And my one friend on the on the Zoom was just bawling. Oh, I, I mean, I mean, it's the saddest song, but you but cello is the saddest instrument oh, ever yeah. made. So if you write the right part, you are basically you're doing the sort of art of manipulation to the audience and just like twist if you need to twist the knife, you know, like, and that kind of stuff is exciting. For me yeah. it's like um figuring out exactly what piece will go into the puzzle to make it work the best it can you know yeah um i wonder if it was you who suggested the cello or or me i might have suggested the cello for for adidang uh no oh. no no for adidang or for uh hosea um i think i might have suggested the cello for hosea Yes, I did because I know I knew that Sebastian played the cello at one point, and I wanted to bring him in to like kind of do that, and so yeah, and I don't remember when we did I didn't know if it was before that or after that, but whatever. Um, yeah, it's, I know. I mean, it's, it's my favorite I, answer. I just love it. It's beautiful. I, I love the cello. Yeah, yeah. Um, favorite instrument: guitar. Second, cello cello specifically because of its sadness i i don't know there's you know me i like everything sad <laughs> well i prefer you sad i mean not not as a person yeah. as an artist <laughs> as an artist i think you're, you're most effective like nothing like that song nothing is really yeah your your best i think your best song and our, our best production but it's just it's sad you know um yeah but as far as cello goes my 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 mentor at berkeley because I, I studied film scoring at berkeley uh in boston and he uh, he finally said to me at one point, he's like, Jody, you're going to have to stop writing only for the cello. <laughs> I was like, but why? Like every score was like, here comes the cello, you know, and and because uh, I had this one cello, it was so good. And um, I just loved to write for her. And, and he was like, Jody, you're going to have to, like a flute or piano, anything, literally anything else. Just no more cello for six months. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, but it's my favorite to write for. Yeah, there there is one song that I like to do it in a ukulele. I have not written it yet, but I have in mind a song with ukulele. Uh, uh, you know, I I'm gonna have to learn how to play the ukulele. Uh, but of of course, Sebastian also knows how to play the ukulele. So, <laughs> oh, make him bring it. I know. I uh, I texted him one day. Hey, I'm thinking about doing a song in ukulele. Do you know how to play it? And he said yes. And then my follow up question: uh, Do you have a ukulele? Because I was thinking if you didn't, I was going to lend you mine. And he says yes. And I'm like, of course you do. <laughs> He's got everything. Do you? Uh, well, if you've got, it, do you do you play the ukulele well, or have, do you not really? No. Um... No, I, I don't even know the chords. So, I mean, I, I kind of looked them up and and um, and so I I don't I don't know the chords yet. Yeah. I mean, it's it's I had I don't have it memorized. So, yeah. So, I'm going to have to like practice. Um, okay. it, won't, it won't be by the 21st. No, this is like so down the road cuz I haven't even written the song yet. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Looking forward to hearing that. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, so my, my second album, uh, I think almost every song or possibly every song will have sort of like a, it's a call and response kind of thing. So there's a, a counterpart 
to it. So Jose and Gomer, uh, Jose is the counterpart to Gomer. Um, and um, so I have your voice. So I have a song that I'm writing called My Voice. And then um, the song, the um, I mean, your voice, that's a Korean song. Yeah, so it's gonna be another Korean song. Actually, it's gonna be a mix, Korean and English. Um, and yeah, so it's gonna be like, you know, there's sort of pairing of songs. And um, I love a concept album, JJ, you know? I yeah, do. no, it's totally a concept album. Yeah, so, but the concept is still being formed, um, but anyway. I love that. I mean, I had a manager yeah. one time uh, back when I was a, still doing a sing, solo singer song or anything. It was the first album I ever produced, um, uh, which is my first solo album called The Blur of Green and Blue. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd done EPs and stuff, but it was my first like big, you know, 12 song, whatever, 11 song thing. And I came to the first session with all the songs written down in order. And, and Dave said, he looked at me, he's like, well, that's not the way records work you you record the songs and you decide the order later and i was like nice. no what are you talking about this is the order of the song this is what they're gonna like that's not the way i work and i just i i like i things have to make yeah sense as a story exactly before i before i record a note for me as an artist i, I just can't make sense of how i'm gonna record it you know unless i know and all my artists work differently i don't want to force them you know um like Sherelle and I are going back and forth on her order right now. And like, you know, <laughs> and we're, you know, if, if we pull one song out and maybe don't put it on the album, like, what does it do to the whole thing? It just blows the whole thing up. So we're like having this back and forth, but I'm, you know, and then the first daughter and son record, which is one of my favorite things I've ever done. It, it, it definitely has a, mm -hmm. a arc of a romantic relationship. So from the meeting to the sort of like, you know, um, saying goodbye at the end. Yeah. Um, so, and we wrote that as a concept album. So not even like before we even wrote a note, we decided we were going to sort of try to do an arc that way. And, yeah. um, and I, I don't know, it worked out pretty well, I think. No, I no, I, I love those songs. Um, but by the way, you're, you're blue and blue and green. Mm -hmm. Is that the title? The, the, the blur of green and blue. The blur of green and blue. That album uh, was, had has been on my playlist for my driving trips. <laughs> it's a good, I mean, that's why it's a, It's called The Blur of Green and Blue. It's like watching everything go by, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, um, yes, I started writing that album in the 90s. Like I started writing one of the songs back when I was uh, on tour with Second City. And that song, Blur, made it 10 years later to, to, to that album, a slowed down version of it and then it was it's so it's like 10 years of writing in one um yeah ah, yes yes particularly the blur because you have a, a sort of a fast rocking kind of version and then you have the very slow very sad kind of version yeah exactly you do you got to you know your I, facts you, Jody, I, Jody Sheldon facts yes I I well yeah because that's also like one of my one of my uh favorite uh songs on that album it may be Aww. my the my the favorite song on that album maybe uh, it's a very no one no one listens to that song i'm always aware of like what songs are like really? in what order on on like streaming and there's this one song from the daughter and son record that's always number one and it was we almost didn't put it on the album because we thought it was we couldn't figure out the concept or whatever and then blur is one that uh, it, it, it's always like last, <laughs> you know, and I love it. I don't know why. I you know. know. Why, why do people listen to stuff with it? I don't know why. I have no idea. I love it. And you know song. your number one song today, JJ? I, I looked because I didn't get the link. You Nothing did. is number one. The one I was going to play of yours is number one. Wow. On, on, on Apple Music. Well, because I think for a while, um, Falling was number one. Um, I, I think Falling is accessible in terms of the story and the song. I mean, it's clearly it's about a, you know, um, a relationship that's breaking apart, you know, um, and, you know, everyone can relate to that. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think my songs are necessarily opaque. Um, a lot of them do have sort of like layered meanings, 
And so it's not apparent as to like exactly what the song is about. Uh, there is there is one song on the album. It's about suicide, but I don't think anybody would know. <laughs> I mean, I love those, yeah. you know, when, when you don't want to give too much away as far as what something is about. Like yeah. one song on, my, on the Blur Green and Blue, uh, it's called Photograph. And it's, it, I, I wrote it about a relationship that could never, you know, you have those people in your life who you know, you're never going to be together. There's no way you could ever be together, but you're, there's feelings there, you know? And so oh, yeah. I wrote, the first verse is, is 10 years ago, or t 10 years ago. The second verse is five years ago. And then the, th the third verse is right now. And it's about this one specific person. And I, you know, I wrote it you know, many years ago for about that. And uh, someone in my band who I broke up with, uh, you know, broke the band up or whatever, <laughs> came up to me at the, at the show, one of my first solo shows. And he goes, I love that song you wrote about the band, <laughs> Photograph. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, yeah. It's I, it's it was really hard. I, I'm glad you like it. But I didn't write about the band, you know. It's like he, but he thought I did. So I, I don't want to spoil his, you know, fun. So you know, I like I like to let just people, you know, think what they want to think. But that's but that that's actually very astute of you to do that. Like me, I would probably would say, oh, thank you, but it was it wasn't about <laughs> that. <laughs> No, I don't want to. I don't want to ruin anybody's, you know, story. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. But I mean, but that's probably better. That's a better response than you know what I would I would say because <laughs> like I would say, uh, well, thank you. Well, you know what? I I really should learn to just say thank you and then move and <laughs> shut my mouth. And not it's taken me a long time to learn to to, to to shut down. You know. It's it's um, it's, a, it's definitely a skill. Um, so is there any particular aspect of working with an artist uh, that you enjoy particularly? Like, um, I mean, not necessarily technical, but like a kind of experience that you enjoy. And this is why you enjoy working with artists. I mean, probably my favorite thing is day one when they bring something in. Um, and I, and I just know that it's, you know, I, I work with this artist named Sherelle Bryant, um, who I think, I think her album is going to be really big. I think she's going to be, I think she's going to blow up. I think she's really great. Um, but, uh, but she came, uh, her voice teacher is actually Katie, um, who I was in Daughter and Son with. And she put us up together and, and we've been making, you know, music together. And Katie's been trying to get her to do this, to record this one song. That's a very personal song. And um, I don't think she wanted to record it because it was so personal. But the, the day that she brought it in to me and Katie finally pushed her and, you know, I was kind of like saying, I want to hear the song, I want to hear the song. And she came in, she came in and played it for me. And I just, I said, if you don't record this song, I'm going to be so <laughs> upset. <laughs> because it, but when you first hear, when you hear it, just a guitar and a voice, and you can hear in your head, the cello and the background vocals and, all the stuff that it could be. And it's yeah. already a great song and her voice is great. And it's gonna, you know, and then when you can, when you can bring that to life, it's just, um, that moment's my favorite. And then doing background vocals. I love that moment of like discovery, especially when you stack tons of, of vocals like we did on Nothing on your song. Yeah. Um, um, I just love vocals. I'm a singer, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, and I love to sing harmony. I grew up in a bluegrass band, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and singing in church, you know, and that kind of thing. And um, the the lady in the bluegrass band, we I remember we were getting in her car when I was like twelve years old. I was a you know kid, and the the car alarm would go, eh, and she'd be like, eh, eh, you know, we'd like sing harmony with the car alarm. Um, <laughs> but I I love singing harmonies. I love I love background vocals. So th those are my two favorite things of all the. I love all of it, but I love the very beginning, and then sort of like the background vocal building, which I always usually stacked a ton of vocals and I love the very end when we can step away from the painting and listen and listen to it and there's not anything I would change I mean over time that changes like a year later I was I'm always like oh I would I wish I could go back and fix that EQ or whatever oh, but when you can yeah. yeah I actually I learned to not do that once it's been recorded and it's been put out I I, I had to you know I had to learn how to do that with my first album it's like Cause it's done and it's out there. There's, you can't do anything with that. So I had to like psych myself out to say like, okay, 
that's that was the best you know that we could do at that time and it's fine um uh, so the next one you know we'll do differently or better or whatever yeah that's smart i mean i i, I just get so hard on myself you know <laughs> i know I, and, I, and i just i'm such a control freak and i want things to be a certain way and and I, and I don't i never tell people what i think is wrong you know i never tell the artist i never tell you know i might if it's like katie or someone i collaborated closely with i might we might um, talk about how we wish we could go back and speed up a tempo. There's one song we wish was faster. Um, <laughs> just, I can't. It's always like one of the top, one of our top songs, and I, and I, we both listen to it. We're like, it's, it's like six ticks too slow. It's too slow. Um, and I just shared that with with you in the world. So, um, but I didn't say which song. I didn't say which song. Uh, let's um, let's listen to one of the songs. The the one that you said. Um, who was it? Uh, the Wait, is that one of the songs that you sent me? Um, um, yes, uh, no, well, it's not, a, this one, no. But this one is the one, let's do Whisper, Daughter and Son Whisper. Okay. Um, this is one that we, I've always loved this song. I thought it was so beautiful. It's, and it's about that moment, JJ, of intimacy with someone, like when you're, when you're really close to them uh, for the first time. And it doesn't have to be like a, like a boyfriend or girlfriend or, or something. It could be a friend too, like when you meet, um, someone that you really, really um, connect with, and then you start to tell secrets, and you start to, you know, um, it's that kind of song. And so this mm -hmm. is sort of like the middle of the of the. Remember this this album is a sort of love story arc. So this is that that first real moment of intimacy, um, and it's always like in the top three of our streaming, um, even though we almost t took it off the album. And now I've, I've just grown to love it, and I love the simplicity of it. It's just two voices and two guitars. Uh, and piano, and that's it. Um, and it's really, really simple. It's called Whisper. And, and I just want to point out, look how hot you look in this picture. I it's uh, I do, don't I? Thank you. You sure, really then. do. No, when I saw that, because like I knew you when you were like that nerdy crew cut and glasses, you know, look. And then and then you do this, and I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> well, this is the first time we ever had, you know. I've got makeup. I like someone came and did makeup, and we we had a stylist, and we had hair and lighting, and a, like a Sherman uh, Linus who who does everyone's photo, like like all the famous musicians' photos came, and we spent all this money, and yeah, I'd better look hot for all we did. <laughs> Are, are you Kate, Kate looks like a model look at that she looks oh good. yeah no well yes Kate always looks beautiful uh but but like I knew you when you had that sort of nerdy glasses look you know so to go from that to this it was like very different um I gotta say I felt I always hate being in front of the camera I don't like it but I, I felt good that day I was like okay I'm looking all right but I had like a JJ I literally had a team of people you know, <laughs> making me look this way. So it's not like a natural occurring from within my soul. This is like, you know, a team of people coming and making me look like a human person, you know? Yeah, but so. still, uh, you wear the coat hanger. So it's a Korean expression. Like somebody compliments you on your dress or, or your outfit. And then your response is like, oh, because, you know, the coat hanger is good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway. back in these days, I was a, a few a few ticks skinnier, so <laughs> maybe I are, was more of a. Are you hanger. sucking in your cheeks to make uh, to highlight your cheekbones here? No, no, that is one hundred percent the lighting. That is, they did lighting ah. to make us both look like we were wraiths or something. It looks so. Yeah, I'm not doing anything. I'm literally not doing anything. <laughs> he's like, he's like, he would always tell me like, look down and look up, and that's what I did a lot. I like look down and look up. I don't know what that did, but it it made it got one good picture at least. Looks like. Yeah. Oh, and then and Roman Peters, a comedy person who does graphic design, and a dear friend of mine, that shot actually is a wide shot of the two of us, like a, like a two shot. You uh -huh. can see our whole torsos and stuff. And then it was Roman's idea because he did the graphic design. His idea was to go tight, like to go all the way in on our faces like that. And we were we would never have thought of that. I would never have thought. And then that became this i just think it's beautiful what they what our team of like five people did to make us look nice yeah so. um i i already have in mind that all my um album covers my face will not be on it uh it it will all be my own artwork whether it's a photograph that i took and i doctored or something that i drew or sketched or, or something so because like my first album i did some really really stupid looking charcoal 
<laughs> it was mine, so I claim it. <laughs> I mean, anyway. I, I tried to do my own graphic design for like one album and it, it's just not as good. This is just much better. Well, you gotta get someone oh. who knows what they're doing. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I mean, me, it's just a selfish reason. But okay, you know, for that, let's play. Let's listen, listen to Whisper, play that track. Oh, it's gonna play Whisper, okay. Why isn't it playing? I think you're, I don't know. Oh, I have to do that. Okay, there we go. I tend to like songs with simple instrumentation. So I think I always resist when you want to put uh, this track and that track and drums and this and that and all the bells and whistles. I'm like, can we keep it simple? <laughs> but well, I think it depends on the thing, like what you're trying yeah. to achieve, you know, and, and, 
And for that record, we didn't have any drums. We didn't have um, budget for drums. So, um, you know, I, I didn't have, so it sort of like tied our hands a little bit to, to mm. make a sim simple, quiet little record. And I, it's one it's one of my favorite things I did as a singer songwriter, that, that album. It's really sweet. It was all done mostly, you know, either in our old apartment, Long Island City or in Oscar's apartment that you know well in, yeah. in Brooklyn. Uh, and just me and a lot of it was just me and uh, in Oscar in his bedroom. Kate was in a Broadway show, so we didn't have her as much as we wanted. But but when she was there, she always was, of course, like 110 um, percent. But she was doing eight shows a week, you know. So it was like we, we it was uh, me and Oscar in this, you know, uh, in this in his bedroom, hoping the guy next door would not do any wo woodworking. <laughs> <laughs> like these hipsters and they're woodworking man we'd like let's show up at 11 a.m and it'd be like you know, we're like we're trying to make the quietest record of all time we literally we can't have you like you know, doing a buzz saw right now or whatever it's like oh. I, I didn't realize that they allowed buzz saws in in apartments <laughs> It was in the backyard. He was always in his backyard. Oh, okay. Uh, it was. It was the. We would look out over this one guy's backyard. That's like hipster with a just a uh, never ending, you know, woodworking projects. It was always something, and so we'd like. That's funny. Yeah. Um. Actually, the my favorite of noise on on a record was this is the great story, a Jen Kwok story. You can ask her this on her episode. We were here recording songs for one, and we were. It was a vocal day, and it was like this quiet moment. And these, I call them the hobos. They, they, they hang out in the park sometimes across the way. And they were, one of them had a boom box that day and they were drinking beer. It was like noon, you know, on a Monday or something. And they're drinking, you know, having their fifth beer or whatever and, and playing this boom box. And we couldn't record because it was, you know, music coming from the street. And so I said, Jen, I have an idea. They won't listen to me, but you're a pretty girl. How about if you go out with me and we ask them nicely? And it was, it's so crazy because I've gone out and asked them before, you know, can you please be quiet? I'm doing a recording day. And they're like, oh, no, no, fuck you. And I went out with Jen. They were all like, of course, miss. What, are you, what, do, you, what do you want? What do you need? I'll, we'll turn it off. I'm, well, I'm so sorry. I'm, 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 you know, and I was just like, it's so crazy what women yeah. do. Oh, and yeah. It's just, it's, um, and she was using that voice that, that like, hey, like, we're recording and it'd be really cool, you know? And they, and they were like, oh, so sorry, you know? And it was, I was, we were dying. It was so, and I was like, you just used a, you know, that lady superpower, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, I was gonna ask something, what was I gonna ask? Oh, so the other song that you were mentioning, like, um, the one who was working with Katie and came to you with a song and you, uh, persuaded her to record mm -hmm. is that is that on the list um that song i can't cannot play for you because it's okay. not complete and, and I, I even discussed it with sherelle and i said hey you know she has one song that we produced um that came out last year that we can play it's really okay. good it, yeah yeah but it's totally but it's totally different than the, um the song that's coming out uh um is called gold and it's going to be out later this year but but she hasn't even done the final vocals or anything and so we wanted to wait until it's a little more complete um but you can play say you're sorry it's a really cool song um and i love it
I love that song. I love the Hi. background vocals in that song. Yeah, that's nice. Nice layering. Some of the phrasing uh, kind of reminds me of the 80s a little bit. Yeah, we do a little retro. It's, it's almost like, yeah. like indie rock, like indie pop 90, early 90s. It's sort of like yeah. how I think of her, like a little bit sort of dream pop, a little sort of like, um, there's this, there's a genre called shoegaze, which mm. is kind of like, you know, back on these like the Sundays and like the cure. Oh, like you're know. literally casing um, on your shoes. <laughs> literally just like, hey, I'm like a sad teenager. And that's sort of like, I'm, I'm pulling some language from that. Um, and especially the background vocals and in the drums and bass and stuff. And she put her, her, it's her guitars and the me on everything else. So yeah. Um, yeah. And the pacing too also kind of reminds me of that that era yeah um, oh yeah we yeah, didn't yeah. want to that song could not be rushed it needed to just <laughs> you know what i'm saying if, if it gets faster than that it loses it's like oh yeah. yeah like like california when you know when she'll rode, rolled down oh, like the 80s yeah yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> people anyway. are like what's this <laughs> Anyway, that's Sherelle. She's very sweet, and she and I think her records are just gonna be. It's, uh, people are really gonna love it. Very, very um, so different. That that's a single that came out. So she, you're saying she has a new album coming out? It's a new EP. Yeah. So we're about ninety five percent done. We just have to do the vocals, which we do next week. Um, we're doing them all at once, like over two really long days. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we're gonna mix, and then we're gonna put it out. So I would say summer at the latest. It'll be out. Yeah. But that's the single that came out. We finished that right before COVID and it came out during COVID and then we were kind of stuck. And then, you know, she decided to start working remotely. And so all the people I've played for you today that came out in the past year, it's all been done remotely. Um, mm. uh, so she's in her apartment in Brooklyn and I'm here and we meet, you know, on Fridays and, and discuss ideas. And she records all of those parts at home, at home. backgrounds yeah. and everything. Yeah. Uh, the funniest part is when I sing as her to give her ideas. You know, I'm sounding like, know what? you know, this, this doesn't make it on the record usually, but um, but I do <laughs> mock it all up myself. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the so I went actually I went back and listened to some of the stuff that we were working on before COVID, and um, and I realized like. Um, and we, we kind of stopped working on them. It's like, we were working on some of it last spring, even like, you know, even during lockdown uh, for the live stream uh, thing we did last year. Um, but then after like starting in June, I actually did not work on any music since June. So for like half a year, I didn't touch anything. And then this year I started like listening to them again. And I realized like that gap was huge. And, uh, and I feel like um, I kind of like lost the momentum and I kind of even forgot like what we did with what and why we decided to do that and not something else and you know there's like a lot of sort of loss of um i don't know memory or or whatever it is so i feel like yeah that well, wasn't I mean, I, I, a good choice a, that i made in a good way it's uh, in a, in, i'm trying to think of it in a positive way because sherelle and yeah. i also took a break and and you know a couple of my artists you know went on a hiatus you know for, for good reason but now there's this whole sort of renewed sense of like, yeah. everything's gonna open up and, you know, people can start playing live shows at the end of May and, and you know, and so I, I started feeling it in January, like Rebecca came back and Sherelle came back and, and all these artists that had been sort of like, and Jen came back and, um, and they had all this stuff to do, to, 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 to they, stuff they wanted to say. And even though like someone like Rebecca, um, you know, she doesn't know what she wants to say. All she knows is I'm gonna do a song every month and I'm gonna put it on Instagram. I'm not even gonna release it. I'm just gonna put it on Instagram with a video and we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. Yeah. Um, but then you got people like Jay Mousky and maybe I can play, uh, cause this one just came out, I think two days ago. Um, and it's very, very edgy and it's gonna be the edgiest thing I play today. Um, but it's a song called Eat the Rich. Um, but Jay has been working this whole time. We've been doing remote sessions 
um, almost entirely remote for the, the past year. Um, Jay has a setup in their house, like with, you know, mics and works in logic and sends me tons of tracks. And, um, and Jay and Rebecca are a little different. They both like to send like samples and loops and beats and stuff. And I end up using some of them and not using some of them. And I pitch stuff that we sometimes we use and sometimes we don't. But, uh, but they don't, you know, instead of like playing a piano or something, uh, Jay might play a piano and send me those tracks. But lately it's been more sort of like samples, loops, you know, because we're mm -hmm. living in that kind of world. So this will be the last one, I guess, I play of my artists, if that's okay with you, JJ. Yeah. Um, this is Jay Mowski, Eat the Rich. It just came out. It's great. Go go listen. It's I think it's it's a hot track. And this is a, Jay is a really fun uh like comedy artists, like kind of like comedy stand up, also works in improv. But I just think is a real innovator and someone that does. I mean, just look at that cover. Look at that cover. It's so, <laughs> um, um, and they work in, in a sort of a non binary, you know, language. And it's just everything about what they do is really exciting to me. And I, and I get to work with Jay every week, and they're a good friend of mine. And so this song is really, really fun. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Um, so a lot of the instrumentation uh, is, uh, would you call that synth? Is it There's ton, tons of synths and, and electronic yeah. drums. And, and I'm, I, for Jay's recent stuff, I'm working more like a DJ producer because I'm like doing a lot of splicing. So a lot of that, those vocals at the end are sort of like small pieces from the first half of the vocal that I then snip, you know, put into snippets and then layer and, and effect. So mm -hmm. it's got, you know, tons of effects on it, auto-tune and, you know, delay and reverb and stuff. But then taking, you know, sort of like thinking of, of all the different parts, instruments and everything as individual pieces and then layering them. And then so like when that when all the instruments come out, it's just like the 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 strings and the the, the keyboard. And then you just build, 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 build like a like a DJ would in the club, and okay. that for me has been you know working in hip hop and working in 
in in sort of club music and pop music and dance music and um that's really fun because I, I spent so yeah. many years you know with 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 you know, folk music and singer songwriter music and acoustic music. I love that too. And I love working with Sherelle and that stuff. Um, but to get to work with, with Rebecca and Jay and these, and, and Jen and people who, who push the envelope of sort of synth pop and modern yeah. pop and throwback sort of post disco, you know, and R and B it's just, it's just a really fun language for yeah. me to explore. Cause it's so just like, it's just goofy, dancey fun, you know? Um, and I just, I, I, it's a part, it's a part of myself because I love dance music too, ah. and electronic music. So it's, it's just, um, it's a fun language for me to, you know, get to speak. Yeah. So, so when I was talking to Sebastian, so apparently when he started playing the guitar, um, he, uh, like when he was like, I don't know, a teenager, he, when he was like 15, he formed, he and his friends formed a uh, punk metal band. So that was his start is punk metal guitar. And uh, so we were talking like, oh, maybe we should make one of our, one of my songs, you know, like totally punk metal. <laughs> I don't I think mean, I, I don't think I have the voice for it though. <laughs> you definitely don't, but we could, <laughs> but we can, we could make it sound like something, you know, and we could affect it, you know, in the, in the machine and see what we could do. No, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, be happy in my life until I've hit every genre there is. I mean, I've, I've worked in country, I've worked in bluegrass, I've worked in R&B, I've worked in hip hop, I've worked in uh, classical, I've worked in jazz, I've worked in cabaret, I've, you know, folk music, singer songwriter music, I don't, and people always say, what kind of music are you into? Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm into good music, like, I'm into yeah. everything, just the, yeah. the I, I like specific things within the genres, but um, I love it all, you know, give it, yeah. bring it on. If it's good music, it's good music. It doesn't matter like what genre it, it is. Um, so I actually, I uh, was gonna ask you, is there any particular, either whether it's an aspect of your work or, or a style of music or maybe a, a certain uh, sort of musical thing that you do that you have done that you feel like that's sort of so over you're so over it or like you're kind of tired of it i don't know i mean like right now i'm not tired of anything because i've been off for a year you know what i'm saying like yeah. i've been working this whole time but like as far as performing like i was kind of getting burned out on musical improv before covid mm. um because i had been doing it since 1998 or something 97 mm. um and you know, I, every week and coaching and playing and, you know, it, the money is so much, even if I charge a lot, I can't, you know, it's so you go out to play an improv show in a basement and, you know, uh, on 28th street or whatever for no money. And it's like, I just, I was getting to the point where I'm like, well, you know, I'm in my forties. I don't really want to, I don't have to do that anymore. That's, that was, that was stuff young Jody did. And, you know, I was sort of down to one or two teams and I was like, that's, that's fine with me. But now I'm like ready to play at a musical improv show. Like I'm, let's do it. Let's do whatever. I'll play whatever. I'll do. You know, I want to get out and play. And I'll do anything. But I'm so excited to get out with the people again and do yeah. what we do live. You know, for people. And you asked me if I was retired. I think I'm retired from being a singer songwriter. But I don't know. Like um, John Prine died a few months ago from COVID, and I picked up my guitar and started singing one of his songs. Angel from Montgomery and I put it online and I was just like, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe one day I'll feel that, yeah. you know, buzz again. But I've also yeah. got these, these shows, you know, these musicals that, uh, that have been written that Peter and I have written. There are two of them. Um, and we need to start pitching those and doing readings of those and talking to producers for those. So um, I'm excited just to get back to show business because I've, I love it with all my heart and I love the people and I love theater people and I love comedy people and I love music people. And I haven't seen them, you know, face to face in over a year and I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you're definitely a people person. Um, yeah. So what are some of the challenges? Uh, well, without getting divulging personal information, but well, like, what are some of the, some of the challenges you have uh, with, um, working with different, all the different personalities. It's funny, you should ask that JJ, because I was talking to my therapist about this today. Oh. <laughs> um, 
No, what you try to do when you're in my position and you work with all these different people who have very different needs and very different personalities and very different ways of working. And uh, some people like to work really fast and some people work really slow. Some people want to spend like even Jen Kwok, you know, we have spent literally a year on three songs or like this last song, we spent two weeks on it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's great. And it's yeah. like, you know, that's what that song needed. It needed just a quick, you know? And so it's, that's the challenge for me is not just musically how to give people the best experience, you know, how to bring their music to life or draw it out of them or make it what it was always meant to be or, or something better than they could even imagine. But it's also like the personal part that, mm. um, is it can be really challenging because you're, you know, in what back when we we're in real life, you know, you're in rehearsal rooms and studios and one on one with these people for a very long time sometimes. And, you know, um, uh, you know, there were, I remember recording my, my solo album, The Blue, Green and Blue, my, my engineer, I did not engineer that record, Rob Kanelsky did, did. And Rob Kanelsky just won a Grammy for producing Billie Eilish. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, and so he and he engineered the blur of green and blue and just one for engineering her, which I'm so proud of him. But he and I and my manager Dave, who co-produced the record with me, we would spend. I mean, this is back when we were in those studios in mid Midtown, like Legacy and everything. We would get those. Um, it was before I had a, like a good setup here, and we would get like a call at two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning saying we have we have a, you know we have three to eight. A.M. Mm -hmm. And so we would be in the studio from like three to eight a.m. You know, in Midtown, in Times Square, and you you walk out of there. Like sometimes we walk out at like five in the morning, and Times Square would be like like it is now, like dead. dead you know? Yeah. <laughs> but that's the hardest part for me about about this business is just like rolling with whatever is happening and and trying to do the best you can in that moment. If the the situation is challenging, or the person is challenging, or the you know. Um, it's not just about the music it's about being yeah there for them in a way that's more than just it's it's being a confidant it's being a um a friend it's being a, a mentor it's being a, a a coach um so i because i like to be a one-stop shop for people i i have to do all that myself and so that's the that's the hardest part for me but it's also the most rewarding i think yeah uh, did you realize that you were also going to have to play that role uh, you know, the friend, the coach, you know, and, and in some sense, a therapist <laughs> for your artists, mm -hmm. like when you decided to work with artists? No, but I found out real quick. <laughs> and you have to have boundaries, you know, you have to set boundaries. And sure. say, you know, this is, you can't, you know, because if they're all texting me at two in the morning, I can't. Oh, no, no. Yeah. You know, and so that's why I try to keep all my business on email and try to, you know, like, because um, I, I don't have the, the sort of like emotional mental bandwidth to sort of like yeah. take care of people, um, of all my artists, because um, it's just it's too much of a emotional burden, you know? Yeah, but I could also see the temptation to for your artists to want to sort of reach out to you in, in different moments because... Um, you know, and you know this, like your songs, your, you know, this, this is stuff that you created. It's very personal to you. And you're sharing this, this whole process with somebody else. And um, yeah, I think uh, I jokingly uh, refer to you as, or maybe you, it, maybe it was your sort of response to my joke and you said you were the midwife to my songs or something. <laughs> I mean, that's what it feels like. It feels like you're, you know, there, just push and I'll catch, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, so no, I, I can see, I can see the sort of the impulse or the, or the, you know, but um, yeah, but I think uh, I, I've, I've been pretty good about like keeping uh, those boundaries, like, you know, um, oh, whatever. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, it's that's tough. But um, well, at least you enjoy that part. That's good. <laughs> I mean, I do. I really do but, enjoy it. Yeah. But it's it, it, you know, especially if you're in a if you're doing a show, then it becomes like your 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 kids become double. <laughs> so it's not just your clients; it's your cast. 
And, oh, right, right. And so if you've got, you know, and so for like The Farce Awakens, it was only a workshop. We didn't make it past the four month little workshop at the pit. Um, but I was directing the show. I was head writer of the show. I was composer of the show. I was the music director of the show. I was the, you know, um, if the choreographer wasn't there, I would step in and do a couple of steps. Um, you know, you, you did whatever you had to do because that's what you do and you're putting on a, you know, but you, you're then in charge of and, and needing to be there for um, everyone in the cast, everyone in the crew, everyone, you know, um, everyone yeah. at the venue, every, you know, and so then just because that's when you've got to really take care of yourself and make sure that you're not, you know, that's why I love working on like a, like the, the show we did Village of Vale at Lincoln Center, you've got a stage manager that, that like, like runs it like a tight ship and tells you exactly where to be. You're going to be back in your seat at 704 and you've got to, you know, it's like, I love that kind of structure because otherwise if you've yeah. got all this sort of artistic heavy lifting to do, you, you don't have the space for it, you know? And if someone needs to like go and have a heart to heart because the, this line is not working or this song is, you know, whatever, you've got to be able to have the sort of like emotional space for it. I, I forgot about that. I, I was actually, when I was asking the question, I was thinking about the, the individual artists that you work with, but I completely forgot about the whole, um, you know, um, musical stuff that you do. Yes, because, and I think that that in some ways is, is much difficult, much more difficult because you have then they're all there at the same time. It's not like you're dealing with them one on one. It's a whole. <laughs> no. And the, I mean, people don't understand like the, we, have, we were having our bathroom redone and our contractor did not understand why we couldn't have Broadway. He didn't understand why we can't just have Broadway shows and wear masks and stuff. And I was like, have you ever been backstage at any theater, Broadway theater? Oh, no, yeah. Just, yeah. Have you yeah. ever been backstage? And and he he was like no I've never been backstage I was like even on Broadway, the bit you know the biggest and the best or whatever yeah the dressing rooms are tiny Tiny, yeah the spaces backstage are tiny like it may look like a huge stage but there's so many people dressers and people on lights and people uh, you know um it's, you're practically like dressing in front of each other you know undressing I mean, yeah. and dressing yeah it's like the, that the, back, um, the backstage area at Fifty Shades was like one room yeah <laughs> you know that yeah. was like half the size of this living room and yeah. there were the cast of whatever and then three dancers and you know and you know there's just it's impossible because you're it, you're on top of each other you know it's like that in fashion shows too and so like models you know um, many times or maybe most or all the time they're not wearing all they're wearing is like their panties they're not even wearing bras you know like um, and so like they're, they're basically getting naked in front of each other and I'm just like quickly changing outfits and stuff um, I actually, well, that's why uh, theater, theater people don't even yeah. think about taking off their clothes. I mean, like we, right. we just do it all the time. I mean, it's like, oh yeah, because we, we've been naked or in underwear. And so many, if you've been an actor, you, 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 you lose to. your shame right away. You, know? you can't think about that. Cause if you no. do like, you can't, yeah, you can't change. Yeah. Just no. like, whatever, you know, we all, we all got stuff. I mean, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's not that different from anybody else's. Exactly. <laughs> no, I had to, I remember I had to put on this, I was playing Frederick in a little night music at Columbia College in Chicago in 1990, I want to say six. And I had to take off the outfit, put on a onesie, like a, like a full, like old fashioned 18th century underwear that, that buttoned up the, the front. Yeah. And then, and then put my costume on, on top of that. It was like layers and layers of like vests and, and cravat, you know, cravat and things. Um, and then I had to sing a song. Now the sweet of facility fumbles so lavishly under her lap, that song. And I had to disrobe <laughs> throughout the course of the song into the onesie and then go backstage, take the onesie off, put the thing back on so I wouldn't like melt through the rest of the show because I didn't want to keep the, you know, all those layers on. Um, but it was just like you, and, and I maybe had 30 seconds to do it. It was like, you know, there's yeah. someone there to button your thing and, and, and then dab your forehead and you're back on stage, you know, it's yeah. like, um, but that's for me why I still love theater. You know, that's why I can't wait to do it again. Um, as much as I love producing, I, you know, it's probably my first, um, theater, you know, I, 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 I musical directed my first show when I was 14, my fair lady down in Tennessee. And, at, at Cannon County Playhouse, community theater, you know? And um, and I, you know, it's still my, I think my first love is being, you know, putting together a show wow. for, for an audience to see. So, so you enjoy that frenzy? Oh, it's like being on the best <laughs> drug you've ever been on. I mean, it's just like, 
opening night or like, you know, it's, or that first preview, you know, the first time you're in front of an audience. Yeah. Like it's, it's so thrilling. Like I'll never forget opening night because uh, for the story of a story, ah, I just did a great segue. JJ, we can play a song. Yes. Story of a story. Yes. So um, in 2000, I want to say 15, we were uh, opening at the Chopin Theater in, in Chicago. Um, and me and Peter uh, with our cast of whatever, 12 and, and in this uh, theater, sort of storefront theater in Chicago. And uh, we had been trying our goal throughout all the previews was to get the show under two hours. This was the goal. It was originally like two and a half hours. It was way too long. Comedy should never be two and a half hours. You've got it, you know, you've got to move it along. And so we were going to be under two hours. That was the goal for opening night. And every, every night the stage manager would come over and give us the time at the end of the show. And she came over and it was like 2.06 or like the first time it was like 2.08 or something. And then it was like 2.06 and then we'd cut, 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 cut. And then it was like in rehearse and rehearse and get things moving. Then it was like 2.04, then it was like 2.03. And then she <laughs> arrived opening night and she came over and she goes, guys, we were at one hour 59. And we just like went, we went, <laughs> like, Yay. You can't, not only is it opening night and everyone's there to see and you're about to have the party and everyone's, you know, the press is there and it's exciting, but, but we made our goal of getting it under two hours throughout the course of the preview and that stuff, there's nothing more exciting, you know, than, than opening night or, you know, um, it's the most exciting thing I do in my career. Yeah. <laughs> it's exciting. Yeah. Wow. That, that sounds amazing. Um, all so right, this, so I guess I'll set up this song. So this is the opening number. This was not, after the 2015 run, we ended up rewriting the whole show and like dropping a few songs and writing a few new songs and um, rewriting parts of the script. And we feel so great about it now. Um, if anyone wants to produce a show, we've got a show for you. Um, uh, but this is our, our new opening number. Most of the parts were done by me. All the instruments are done by me. The lead vocal is done by me. Uh, the, it's sung by the full cast and the uh, the our our villain, who's this guy named Masterful, who's trying to get our our two leads um, to come into the world. Ben and Maggie to come into the world of creativity and to and to he's going to give them everything. They're creative people who have their have had their creativity squashed, and he's going to give them everything they ever wanted. So this is uh, the opening number, the new opening number of the story of a story, the untold story. And uh, the song is called Wow, right? It's called Wow. Yeah. Take a look around. We hope you like the things you see. For we're all here to help you become all that you can be. This fancy man has a game plan I've drawn up just for you. Though it's fun you brought a guest So take a seat and let us show you all that we can do We're gonna make you say wow Make you say oh my god Did that just come from me? Your friends will be like hey man Did you know you could write so awesomely? That's just an overview Of what you get when you join our crew We'll make your dreams come true You got a story inside burning up your soul But you just can't seem to get it out Setting ideas free is our only goal That's what this place is all about You see, all of us, we made that decision We're gonna help you recognize your vision All at no cost to you We'll make your dreams come true People say, wow the force of our generation From coast to coast and the other toes Of a literary celebration Show the world you're not a fake Just say yes for heaven's sake Make your dreams come true uh, Write a novel or a play an opera or a story A film that wins an Oscar and every category A sex are taken on bureaucrats Or just write a blog about your kids Spend. Wow, OMG, my man, you're gonna be on fire. You'll be so cool, they're gonna teach you in school. You'll have your every heart's desire. 
desire We all know you're overdue For your big career breakthrough We'll make your dreams come And that's the beginning of our story. Uh, what is the what is the musical about? Story of a story. Um, so it's these two characters, Ben and Maggie. They work uh, for a um, uh, like a, a kids coloring book company, and they're an artist and a writer. And they really want to write the great American novel and to you know to become a great artist. And they're friends, and they're flirty friends, and work friends, you know. Um, and then one day. Uh, Ben gets this e this mysterious email uh, that then opens up a portal into another dimension where Masterful, who you, you just met in that song, and his cast of, of cliched characters live. Uh. <clears throat> and so uh, he's trying to get them to come and write and, and draw and, and be the artist in his world of cliches. And it ends up being this giant war against, you know, to, to save the soul of creativity. And it's very, very... I mean, we, I've spent most of my adult life on this piece and I, it's the best thing I've ever done so far. And I'm very proud of it. It's been produced once and we got a little nomination for a Jeff Award, which is like a Chicago Tony. Oh, wow. And um, we got to go and get dressed up and wear a little badge and, you know, hang out with our cast and crew. And it was real fun. And um, uh, the cast was amazing and, you know, but it was, a you know, we want it to be a bigger thing. And so we were talking to some animation people earlier during COVID. And so that's not really moving forward right now because uh, nothing was moving forward. So um, who knows, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great sort of timeless show. It's a, it's a pastiche show. If you know what that means, all the different, all, all the, the um, songs are in a totally different style. So like we have, because we have these cl cliches we got to write for, it became this fun sort of, you know, thing to write in their style. So we have Disney princesses and we have, you know, um, uh, the this, this sort of like uh, young vet who's about to die and but shows you the picture of his girl one last time, you know, and like the 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 cop who's about to retire, but uh, he gets shot the day before he retired, you know, oh. like, it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah. wonderful cliches and the manic pixie dream girl and all these people. And so we got to, to write for these different characters for me was, a blast and um and we're still i mean we're still developing it um so it's it's uh, really fun to get to do yeah what is that like i mean i think um other than watching the show S smash <laughs> uh how realistic was that show in terms of like what well i i did not i didn't watch that show because oh, okay. um, it's a little too close to home um but it's, I don't know. I mean, Peter and I do all of our writing remotely, most of it. Um, he'll come to New York, I'll come to Chicago and we'll, we'll work on stuff that we need to be in a room for, but mostly it's all done back and forth over email. Mm -hmm. So he'll, um, I do a mean impression of him, the voicemails he'll leave me, he'll, he'll leave, he'll send lyrics. It's sort of a little scene that we will have discussed in, in advance. And then he'll kind of be like, Hey buddy, it's Peter Gwynn. Even though I've known him for 25 years, he says his full name. Yeah. He'll be like, he'll be like, um, and it kind of goes doodly doodly do. You'll figure it out, buddy. And then, and then that's <laughs> what he gives me. And then these lyrics, and then we sort of like go from there. And then we sort of volley back and forth on what needs to, you know. Um, at one point, we got we got this really good note after the third reading of of this in New York, and my this mentor that was uh, Mark Waldrop, he said, "Are you ready for a really hard note?" I was like, "Okay." And he was like, what, what good musical theater always tries to do is put the right emphasis on the correct, so not the, not the emphasis on the syllable. You want to put the emphasis on the syllable. And Peter and I went through and there were like many of them that we had sort of like said, well, that, oh, that's fine. It doesn't have to be exactly like you'd say it, but it's bad writing. It's not good, you know, if you really want to edit yourself and be mm -hmm. and challenge yourself to be a great musical theater com composer and lyricist, you want to to pay attention to those details, and so we the first rewrite we did was to to fix all of those moments, um, and it was a hard note, but it was one that I'm so glad that Mark, you know, who's a 
musical theater composer himself um, gave me and I, we had to, we want to challenge ourselves. We don't just want to be sloppy. So, um, so we did that and that was the first big rewrite. And then after, you know, some feedback and, you know, we got kind of, a, you know, we got all positive reviews in the Chicago press, except for one, the one that matters. Um, uh, and, um, what, and the Tribune, what, Chicago, oh, Tribune. Chicago Tribune, okay. And, and everyone else that sometimes, and everyone else came out the day after the reader, everyone came out the day after it was, it was all positive. And, and the Tribune did not come out right away. And I was, I was like, I know it. I, if it's, I know, I know what it is. And the review came out on my birthday. Uh. And I was walking to my birthday party, just a little gathering of people, you know, a few friends at a bar. And I, and I, I called Peter and I was like, I was so upset. I was like, this, she, she hated it. She l listened to all these things. She's like, oh, it would have been so great if. And then he goes, buddy, buddy, no, no. She just told us what's wrong with our show. It's perfect, you know. So, so that feedback, you know, that that's he he really looks at things like yeah. that as a positive thing. You can you can take those things that are negative, and spin them into you know things that you can do to help your show. Yeah. And um and so where I'm automatically the one that's like, oh no, we're terrible. He's like he's like no, she helped us. She gave us advice, and so just like a mentor would. So, um, he's really helped me to see the world, you know, in, in a slightly different way less negative i would say you know and, so. and actually to that end um what that um critic did is she did her job well then you know that's what a critic should do is be uh critical you know about i mean yeah i mean without like just um you know putting them down but you know be um like critique, like where are the gaps, what's wrong with it, what can be improved. Um, Cause you know, you could have a bad review that's unfair as well. But if- a, Or that's a, just like, I hated it. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. This is garbage, you know? <laughs> or, 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 you know, uh, or maybe a critic would say like, what is this? It's a show about cliche, that's so cliche. You're like, no, that's the I mean, point. Sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, absolutely, and yeah. and so uh, and and I was sort of like, oh, she hates comedy, or oh, she, yeah, you know, like I was going through all this stuff, and 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 I just love, and that's what Peter Peter Gwen, the reason he's such a great collaborator, um, not just because he's talented, but because he has this attitude, you know, before, mm -hmm. like even in in Baby Wants Candy or in a musical improv show, you know, he would like like I was always because I I coached the I, I was so like into the sort of like theory of what we were doing and had been there since the beginning while we're trying to make this thing try to develop it and make it into a, a thing that actually works every time and there's a way to drive narrative and there's a way to tell story and there's a way you know to, to keep things on on the rails and to keep things moving forward and and sometimes you have a, a, an improviser come out and throw a wrench in that or go a different direction and i would always get so bent out of shape about it and go and like gripe to peter about oh god he leave that one move and Peter would be like, no, buddy, no, it's great. Now we can just, you know, we can, we, we can start all over. You know, like he has this, this sort of attitude of like, no, it's a, a curveball is great. Then you get to, to, to deal with the curveball and then make that part of your world. And so he's really great about sort of keeping a, a very positive spin on. That's on awesome. The, the, on the process and not getting, cause you can easily just get so, yeah. So frustrated. You want to, I mean, show business is the hardest and the worst and it makes you feel really bad about yourself most of the time. Yeah. But he's really helped me keep a sort of buoyancy in my work um, and in myself so I don't get frustrated. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. But but I, I think we all, you know, having people like that in our lives is, is so helpful. So it's, it's a blessing, really, you, you know, yeah. Um, shoot, I had a question. I can't remember it now. Hmm. Uh, okay. All right. Well, was well, there anything else that you wanted to share? Uh, did we go through the whole list? We didn't, but I think I'm, you know, you could play one of your songs if you want, but I, you know, you said we, you didn't want to necessarily do that, but I, we can do that if you want. Um, but I play everything that I want to play. Oh, play one of um, my songs. Actually. Yeah. You know what? Let's let, let us take that apart. My song. 
Um, Do we get to play my favorite or are we going to play something? Yeah. Different? No, no. We're playing okay. your favorite. Yeah. Because I, I want to know why it's your favorite. I mean, I kind of do. I mean, we talked about this before, but like we could talk about it again officially. <laughs> oh, and my, my headphones are dying. So I'm oh. going to take them out. And do you let need me, to? Um... Here, let me see. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Where did you come from? Why are you here? Did I invite you to did you suddenly appear? Why do you question me when it's plain as can be? You just lost your man, so I'm here as a friend. I mean, it's just, the, it's the best, you know, on your record, I think. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if I ever told you the backstory uh, of that song. So um, that song was never meant to be sung in public or recorded or anything. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, the first verse, um, was originally written, I don't know, 2009 or something like that. And, um, and it was just that one verse. Uh, and, um, and I wrote that after I was completely heartbroken. And the original title of that song was Me and My Hole. And the hole, <laughs> I know, you laugh. <laughs> JJ, you told me that and I was like, Jay. You know. know what that sounds like, JJ. <laughs> you have to change that title. That that was the first thing you said. <laughs> I may be a comedy person, but I think more than just comedy people would understand what that title uh, means. <laughs> uh, the whole refers to this this emptiness. Like if somebody literally reached into your chest, took out your heart, and there was this gaping hole that was left. 
that that's what it referred to. And again, again, this was not meant to be publicly shared or anything. Okay. So, so like, yeah, that was the title. And, um, and the way I originally um, wrote it, I mean, the melody is exactly the same. The chords are exactly the same, but the way I sang it was is really like, like from your belly wail, like somebody wailing at like a funeral, like an Italian funeral, funeral like kind of wail. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So like, that's kind of like how I sang it. And, um, but you know, when we were putting the album together, I don't think I sang it uh, in front of you, like, you know, um, because I thought it might make it into the album. I kind of just wanted your take on it, um, what you thought about the song and, you know, and maybe it could become something. So I just sang you that one verse and you loved it so much. You said, okay, you need to write more verses, like write two more verses. And then, you know, and then we'll see. See, this is why collaboration, I think, is so yeah. important. I mean, you might hear some, you know, I might hear something that you don't hear, or you might hear something that I don't hear. Um, we were, Sherelle and I were looking for a, a, a sixth song, or is the fifth song for her, like uh, the song to complete her EP. And she brought in four and played all four of them for me because she didn't know which was the best. For me, it was obvious. Like, obvious like that it, it, it's like the missing piece of our album it just is and that's why i think it's important for yeah. people to bounce ideas off each other because if you are just doing it on your own there's no way to really know if something's working if you can't at least get you know some kind of outside and i used to be every everything you know i write everything myself i do everything myself but now i've, I've had to learn to give that up because i don't know everything i i like to bounce ideas off of people and, I, and when I heard that song I was like oh JJ and for me it's the it's the best vocal on your album it's the mm. it's the most successful instrumentation it's got this really simple like strumming yeah. you know Sebastian's doing this really simple strumming really simple upright bass this like um Fender Rhodes keyboard which is really simple and it has a little tremolo on it and then I believe there's 12 of us on background vocals so six of you and six of me is that right it's uh. it's a three three part doubled and then I'm on three. Yeah. Yeah, it's three parts. It's uh, melody and then upper lower. Yeah. And then we're, we're doing all of the parts doubled. So there's four yeah. on each part. Yeah. And so you get that really thick, you know, stacked, but we're barely singing. So there's, you know, a really interesting, mournful, sad sort of uh, yeah. vibe to the song that I just really like like as soon as we got it that i remember the day we sort of stacked the vocals and i was like well that's what i heard that's that's exactly what i wanted to achieve with it so i'm I, pleased I, with it yeah i will say like as soon as you said like yes uh, we're gonna do this and you need to write two more verses and i went back and and the two verses just kind of came out actually uh because it had been a year since i wrote the first verse and i didn't ever think that it was going to be a full song um but then you know it's like okay i have to write so i'm gonna write so like how do i sort of finish this thought you know and uh and the rest of it just kind of like came out almost effortlessly uh i mean like after i drafted it then i, I tweaked it here and there make sure it's like um it fits the structure but uh other than that yeah uh so yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's my thank fave you. it's always been my it's always been my fave i know thank you for seeing the potential in it and uh and you know urging me to actually do something with it um but i will say though like okay the this line always for some reason i don't know i think i feel embarrassed about it and that's why i actually don't like singing it in public it's the line that says you just lost your man and i'm you know just that part and like, so even as we were recording, I was trying really hard to like change that word man to something else, you know, like you just lost your, your, I don't know, your, your heart, your something, something, but like nothing I could think of worked. So I had no choice but to leave it in. And to this day, I feel kind of embarrassed about it. I don't know why. Well, I mean, there's something to yeah. that though. I mean, like, 
one of the most successful sort of confessional singer songwriter albums of all time is Joni Mitchell Blue. I don't know if you know that album very well, but she talks about how in the recording of the album, because it's very personal, almost like too personal. Like um, John Lennon, when he first heard it, he was like, God, Joni, like save something for your, of yourself. For, you know, you're, you're sharing too much, you're oversharing. It's like too much. Yeah. But, but, but now it's lauded as like the supreme example of the form. Like, if, you know, that's, that's how to do it. And she said that she couldn't look at anybody when she was recording it, the vocals. She had to turn the lights off. She had to get the mic in a position that was, it was, it, it felt naked. It felt exposed, mm-hmm. but that's what makes it so successful is that that's what makes us feel as listeners so connected to it. So mm-hmm. emotional about it. When we hear a song like a case of you or blue or, um, you know, it's, 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 it's that intimacy that she creates and that sort of like, um, so close to the skin, you know, like it's, it's, it, uh, it's, it's, almost you know you almost too much to to take in you know so that's yeah. why you've got to really be in it i've got to be an emotional you know emotionally available place to take that album in or i can't i, I just can't do it it's 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 really yeah. a powerful thing to listen to all the way through yeah so yeah so that's that's why i always resisted <laughs> But, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you though, JJ. I mean, for this next album, I think you should, you know, confessional is not a bad thing. And, yeah. and, and telling a true story as honestly and directly as you can is not a, you know, it, it can be a vulnerable thing. But that's why I try to make this space and whatever, wherever we're working a place that feels safe and feels like uh, cre- creative and open and that, that you can, you don't have to be afraid of those things. We can, we can do that here and sort of, create something that's going to be vulnerable so that people can receive it, you know, elsewhere. But, but yeah. I think you have the ability to do it and, and you have that tremulous quality of your voice and, and that sort of like throaty nature that I like to always, you know, drop you down to the basement, JJ. I want you <laughs> alto. I want I want everything to be low. I want, I don't want any soprano. I don't want any head voice. I want it to be throaty and you know, and that's, and, and so, Maybe that's something you can really work on is, is that emotionality, that, that feeling of, of um, sharing something that's, that's a little personal, a little, a little yeah. you know, hard. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I guess I, I always thought, well, all of my songs are autobiographical in that sense. Um, I mean, even this concept album, it is. Um, although I, you know, there are a few songs that I, I feel uh, I, I can't quite seem to sort of like, tap into that deep part you know um yeah I don't know I I, I just have to keep working on it but um but yeah uh well two weeks from two weeks from now uh that should be interesting um so you guys won't know will not know what songs I'll be bringing to work on (laughs) you guys will be doing this cold (laughs) What are we even going to play? I can't prepare nothing. <laughs> so that should be interesting. Um, all right, Jody, where can people find you and your work? Um, I, I don't have a website, <laughs> um, but I do, you know, you can follow me on social media. So Instagram or, or I, I do most of my, you know, I haven't I've been kind of during COVID laying low on, on social media, um, but Jody underscore Shelton on Instagram. No, that's not right. It's in Jody Land. Jody oh Land, God. I think. JJ, yeah. I'm so bad at this stuff. I haven't had to do this stuff in years, so I don't do it. <laughs> um, it's not like... Um, or if you want to listen to more from Story of a Story, I believe it's the storyofastory.com. Oh, okay. You have a website. All right. Um, I'm going to look it up. See, that I, w- I wasn't prepared for that. Um, yeah, I need a bio from you. Or, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll send I'll send it over. I forgot to send a bio to you, but I, I have yeah. I have a bio, um, and I'll, I'll include the uh, story of the story website and stuff. Too. Okay, okay, yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, we'll um, put it in the comments down below. We'll put it in the <laughs> comments down below. We'll do it, put it in the comment. Yeah, um, I've been watching a lot of YouTube. I know. So I've been I've been asking all my guests to do this. Hey, would you tell our audience to follow my channel? Am I saying it now? Hey, yeah. follow JJ. <laughs> 
Hey, hey, everybody out there in Cyberland, follow JJ's channel. It's called Beer Pong. What is it? Beer um Cake. Beer Cake. Beer Cake. The, the musical starring JJ Co. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's what I get asking a comedian. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Okay, let me do this right. Do this right. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> hey, everybody, it's me, Jody Shelton. Just follow, just in, like and subscribe. <laughs> that's perfect. It's fine. <laughs> it's beer cake. Who doesn't love it? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, wow, this was so much fun. Um, I know, like, you, uh, whenever we work together, we talk a lot. But um, but I think I got to like ask you a whole bunch of questions that um, and uh, and we got to talk a deeper about stuff that we don't normally do. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, I don't like talking about myself usually, but but I told you at the beginning of this for you anything, JJ, anything. Um, yeah, you know what you you did end up talking. Uh, quite a bit about yourself, but you did also talk a lot about the people that you work with, like the artists and all that. So, yeah, so that was always cool. I like to talk about yeah. them. I do love to talk about them. The, you know, me is fine, but it's the, the they're doing the you know they're they're the stars right now. I'm just backing them up. Um, yeah, and I'll be talking to one of your uh, uh, one of my fellow artists. Um, uh, Jen Kwok next month. That's yeah. right. That's right. That should be fun. She's... We're gonna have some real serious girl talk about music and about life stuff. I mean, yeah, she's one of my faves, and you got to get that little Wolfgang. He's the cutest little thing oh, anybody's that's right. ever seen. He was here for a vocal session when he was like maybe nine months old, and and it was just like, and at one point he wouldn't stay quiet unless someone was holding him, and Mama had to sing. So I was literally like engineering and producing the session, cueing Jen over my shoulder while Wolfgang was right here. <laughs> so um, he was part of that that recording. Uh, uh, I oh, I should I should tell the audience about that too. We did Jen Kwok and I did the music for a really cool podcast called uh, Sunstorm, mm. uh, which is uh, hosted by Ajin Poo and uh, Alicia Garza, one of the um, founders of Black Lives Matter. And they asked Jen and I to do all the music for it. It's 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 basically a, a progressive podcast for women by women. You know, like um, uh, talking about you know supporting other women and lifting them. You know, especially women of color and lifting them, themselves up and being you know supportive of each other. And we did some really like I think very cool music, me and Jen. And so uh, that that is available where you get your podcasts. So is that um, is like the intro outro music? Yes, and all their transitions and things. So we okay. did like there's like there's like cues that are like kind of like empowered and like, oh, okay. and like <laughs> loving and like and like march, you know, like different kinds of uh, music. And it all has Jen's voice and like lots of those vocals that I like to layer. And it's got kind of a hip hop feel, a little a little R and B, little yeah. pop. Um, I really love the soundtrack of that podcast. It's, what I, it's like a podcast, you know, music, but but I just think it's. It's cool, it's cool music that I listen to just on its own all the time. So nice. Um, maybe they'll put out a, a, an album or an EP or something. I would love that. Yeah, that would be cool. Actually, my intro outro music is uh, from one of the guitar tracks that uh, Sebastian did that we ended up not using. So I just kind of like, oh, this is this is nice. I'm just gonna steal it and uh, and do it. I did tell him about it afterwards. I'm like, oh, by the way. <laughs> This is what I did. I hope you're okay with it. And he's like, I, and I do credit him, like in the, you know, in the place, uh, the place card that I put. So totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, right. well, JJ, thank you so much cool. for having me. I, yeah, I this is so your, much fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing it. Sorry, of I course. interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> Never interrupt me. No. Yeah. It's fine. Um, but I'll see you in a couple of weeks when we do our live stream. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, Bushy tail and bright eye. Oh, God. Also, what, what, what time of day is it? Uh, well, it's, it's noon. Yeah, whatever. It's no, fine. It's fine. <laughs> I don't do anything before noon, honey. So I was about to say, what is it like? Ten? I don't do anything. Ten? No, no, no. In the morning? <laughs> no, we'll be there at noon, and I'll be bringing the three bottles of whiskey. Great. <laughs> maybe maybe I will have more than us. Maybe we'll get nice and drunk for uh, the people. Who knows? It, it's fine. I you know I I expect kind of like a I just want like a fun 
but collaborative kind of vibe going. And I mean, I, I do want it to be like an honest working session that we just happen to be streaming live. Yeah. And happen to be really drunk, that's all. And happen to be really drunk, yeah. <laughs> okay, so just hit like and subscribe. Thank you, thank you, Jody. Thank you.